Okay. Call to order, please. I would like to welcome all the guests in the audience today. This is a committee of the whole meeting and is comprised of all members of council. Today's agenda lists all the items before committee for consideration. The recommended motions are shown in boldface. Copies of the agenda are provided on the landing and are also posted on our website. Today, today's meeting is being live streamed and any participation in meeting proceedings will become part of the public record. The recording from today's meeting will be published on the county's website immediately and can be viewed by selecting the streaming tab on the county's homepage at thecounty.ca. At this meeting, any person in the audience may speak to any item on the agenda for three minutes. Under agenda item five, I will be asking for comments from the audience. Please raise your hand at that time and indicate which agenda item you wish to address. The maximum time allotted under this section is 30 minutes. Your name will be included in the Committee of the Whole report and form part of the public record and posted on the county website. We request that you provide a written copy of your remarks to the clerk for the record. When you speak, please stand at the podium, turn on the microphone, and provide your full name and address, your full name and address your comments to the chair. Following the deputation, there may be questions from members of the committee, so please remain at the podium to respond. Any motion made at this meeting is not final until the council meeting of February 18th, 2020, at which time the council may approve, amend, defer, or otherwise change the motion made by this committee. You may attend the council meeting to see the final disposition of any item from today's agenda, and you may speak again at council, but you will be limited to three minutes unless you register first and are listed on the council agenda. The clerk's office can provide information and adv advice on this process. There is also a brochure on the landing and posted on our website for information for deputations. Uh, as a matter of housekeeping, to exit the building in the event of fire, please use the stairs outside the door of this chamber or the stairs off the committee room to the left. Do not use the elevators and please turn off or mute all cell phones. Can I have a motion to confirm the agenda? Councillor Margetson and Councillor Roberts. This is a Margetson Roberts motion that the agenda for the Committee of the Whole meeting of February 6, 2020 be confirmed. Thank you. All in favor? Carried. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, item three, uh, disclosure of pecuniary interest and the gender nature thereof. None. That moves us to four deputations. Uh, 4.1, Jen Ackerman to address committee regarding the climate emergency. and council members. Thank you once again for hearing another deputation. My name is Jen Ackerman. I'm here today to talk about trees. I would like to share some facts that I have received after I requested information from the county records. Over the past four years, the number of mature trees that have been removed from the county is as follows. In 2016, 39 trees were removed, zero were planted. In 2017, 52 trees were removed, and 15 trees were planted. 2018, 188 trees were removed. Not one replacement tree was planted. In 2019, 79 trees were removed and only 19 were planted. These facts showing that 358 trees were killed and only 34 were planted in their place is completely unacceptable and shameful. These numbers do not include the acres upon acres with thousands of trees and bushes being clear cut to make way for more high-end development. 
These numbers also do not include the numerous trees removed by hydro or by individual property owners or by farmers clearing acre after acre of hedgerows. They do not include the many trees lost to the effects of changing climate conditions like drought, severe storms, strong winds and increasing disease. Roadside trees are marked for cutting by county employees, not a professional trained and experienced arborist. In fact, an arborist is only called in for an opinion if a member of the public makes an inquiry about the reason for the large X sprayed on a particular tree. One local independent arborist told me of his frustration with the county's decision to remove trees that he advised did not need to be cut. He said he has many times made suggestions to simply trim, not completely cut these trees, and then witnesses the tree's removal, despite his efforts and expertise. There are other local arb arborists who are equally frustrated by the county's unwillingness to accept their expertise and cautionary advice. I wonder if county workers have an income possibly on the side selling this valuable wood? Is that why the healthy trees are removed? There's a lot of money to be made from 358 large trees. Other municipalities are planting thousands of trees, such as Kingston, with an impressive 37,000 trees in four years, compared to our embarrassing 34 individual trees planted here in the county. Trees and all habitat are being removed at an alarming rate, mainly due to the county repeatedly accommodating large contractors' proposals to keep building housing developments and ultimately contribute to the local affordable housing crisis. The most disturbing so far, is my opinion, is the loss of hundreds of beautiful mature trees, grassland, waterfront, and delicate habitat that was once that was home to several endangered plant species. This is because the county ignored and went against the wishes of local people and improved a tourist cottage resort in Cherry Valley. A large American company is the developer. There was a time when agriculture and young families were thriving in the county. Now schools are closing and young people move away. Where I used to pick cherries and apples, tomatoes and strawberries as a girl, the land is now stripped, having been sold off for private profit. I was informed by county personnel that one reason for the lack of replanting compared to removal is because there aren't enough suitable places to plant trees. The county is 1,050 square kilometers. Like most people who can do math, I find this response totally ludicrous. Aftercare was yet another excuse I was given for not replacing down trees. If each one of the hundreds of new houses that were being constructed were given, with, were given two trees as a welcome gesture, a housewarming gift from the county, then new homeowner, homeowners would be there to take care of the trees. With proper information, these new homeowners, homeowners could understand that the trees would improve the dollar value of the new home, create shade on a cleared and now barren housing site, provide habitat, beauty, improve air quality, and help in a small way to reestablish trees in a community of people and nature, now being stripped of its once thriving tree canopy. I was told that the cost of replanting is too high. In my opinion, the cost of removing the trees in the first place is too high. Not replanting a tree at all has a far greater cost to us all. Given the toll of fire, flooding, and rising insurance rates worldwide, we can no longer ignore what many have been advising would inevitably arrive at our own doorstep. Considering the windfall to the county that comes with so many recently issued building permits and the recent government grant for $1.1 million, I am sure a percentage of this profit could be invested into the environment which has been robbed of its trees. At No Frills this past summer, I purchased an eight-foot red maple for less than $100. I have a short video that I would like to share with you at this time, which will sum up what my point is here today. This is not a drill. My name is Greta Thunberg. We are living in the beginning of a mass extinction. Our climate is breaking down. Children like me are giving up their education to protest. But we can still fix this. You can still fix this. To survive, we need to stop burning fossil fuels. But this alone will not be enough. Lots of solutions are talked about. But what about a solution that is right in front of us? 
I'll let my friend George explain. There is a magic machine that sucks carbon out of the air, costs very little, and builds itself. It's called a tree. A tree is an example of a natural climate solution. Mangroves, peat bogs, jungles, marshes, seabeds, kelp forests, swamps, coral reefs, they take carbon out of the air and lock it away. Nature is a tool we can use to repair our broken climate. These natural climate solutions could make a massive difference. Pretty cool, right? But only if we also leave fossil fuels in the ground. Here's the crazy part. Right now, we are ignoring them. We spend 1,000 times more on global fossil fuel subsidies than on natural-based solutions. Natural climate solutions get just 2% of all the money used on tackling climate breakdown. This is your money. It is your taxes and your savings. Even more crazy, right now when we need nature the most, we're destroying it faster than ever. Up to 200 species are going extinct every single day. Much of the Arctic ice is gone. Most of our wild animals have gone. Much of our soil has gone. So what should we do? What should you do? It's simple. We need to protect, restore and fund protect. Tropical forests are being cut down at the rate of 30 football pitches a minute. Where nature is doing something vital, we must protect it. Restore. Much of our planet has been damaged. But nature can regenerate and we can help ecosystems bounce back. Fund. We need to stop funding things that destroy nature and pay for things that help it. It is that simple. Protect, restore, fund. This can happen everywhere. Many people have already begun using natural climate solutions. We need to do it on a massive scale. You can be part of this. Vote for people who defend nature. Share this video. Talk about this. All around the world, there are amazing movements fighting for nature. Join them. Everything counts. What you do counts. Together with the county system. Together with the County Sustainability Group, we have come up with a land regeneration project that will help offset the dangerous business as usual developments that are taking place in the county. Here's some background on the County Sustainability Group. This group of about 60 members and over 300 Facebook followers has been active in the community since 2005, doing generous and beneficial environmental work without taxpayer funding. Some of these achievements over the years include raising funds through selling rain barrels and composters in order to donate money to help worthwhile environmental causes. To date, more than $10,000 has been raised and given to PECI graduates in environmental bursary awards. This now also includes young organic farmers, totaling up to $2,000 awarded per year. The County Sustainability Group has been involved in sponsoring Green Home Tours, the Green Symposiums at Loyal Co Loyalist College, bringing expert speakers for presentations into the county, and outreach to schools around Earth Day themes. For 10 years, CSG has been frequently put frequent environmental columns in the county weekly news. They've also provided water quality testing on water bodies around the Quinney area with Water Rangers Canada and have advocated strongly for clean, renewable wind and solar energy and participated in demonstrations, rallies and marches in support of action on climate change. There are endless volunteers' hours spent creating and maintaining an informative website that educates the public on global and environmental issues plus the challenges associated with climate change and environmental degradation. Up-to-date news and articles are added to this website and Facebook page daily. 
When considering the many losses I have mentioned and adding to the fact that the county has also lost our beneficial wind farm and the 185 acres of pollinators habitat that was planted, provided and paid for by WPD, then what I am suggesting sounds pretty insignificant. But I am proposing that the county fund our tree and wildflower plantation. This project will be planted far enough back from the Turbine 9 site that it will be in no way hindering the progress of a potential new wind farm in the future, if we are so fortunate to be offered a second chance. The cost of these red oak and white pines is $1,820.43, and there will be numerous other expenses incurred over the next several years, as more acres of trees are planted annually. Ongoing expenses, such as planting a natural ground cover like hemp or clover, water, maintenance tools, a mower with a cultivator, wildflower and grass seeds, are more detailed, a more detailed list of expenses will be provided as they are researched and calculated. In mid-April, these saplings, which are partly funded through the 50 million tree program, will be arriving. There is much prep work to be done before then and money is needed to do this work. I am estimating a minimum of $20,000 will be required. I understand that Council has generously granted an equal amount of money to special interest groups as they were struggling to pay their ongoing legal cost incurring during lengthy wind farm fight. In fact, considering the fact that not only was $20,000 given to these groups, they were also granted the privilege of using the county's charitable status to issue tax-exempt receipts for money donated. Considering this precedent that was set back in 2013, it should be a non-issue providing the same generous contribution to the county sustainability group, where this time the money will be put towards a constructive outcome. It will support a worthwhile cause with benefits for all, not lawyer fees. I feel it would be only fair to show support for the county sustainability group as we continue to do so much beneficial environmental work. We need the county's help to financially support this essential effort. The county is not leading the way to a greener future in any way. After declaring a climate emergency, we now know they were just impressive words. I see no action that remotely shows movement in a positive direction. Those of us that understand the speed at which the planet is being destroyed feel impelled to push back against the dysfunctional value systems and mentalities that contribute to that. We must take a stand and it starts at a local level. We all share this space. We all need to work together. And when we do, it will create a positive outcome. Please join our efforts as we literally plant a greener, healthier future for the generations next to come. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Is there any questions for Jen? <coughs> Councilor St. Jean. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for that, Jen. Uh, one, one particular question, I, I've got several, but I'll start with uh, one, and then I'm sure there'll be others that maybe follow along. Uh, have you or are you aware of the Tree Advisory Committee that uh, the municipality has established and what it is that their uh, terms of reference outline and, and, and where they are in the process? Have you spoken to anybody there? I know about the Adopt a Tree program, which is great, but um, I haven't really seen or heard much of anything else. Okay, well, that committee is relatively new and uh, I. I, I would think that you will find that a lot of your concerns, not all of them, but a good a, a, a good amount of them are being considered by that very public, it, it's a public committee. Uh, Councillor Hirsch, I believe you are on that committee. So uh, maybe that would be a good place to start and you could learn a little bit more there. And maybe things, what you want to do, can work coincidentally with what the county is already doing at this point through the Tree Advisory Committee. Councilor McNaughton. Uh, thank you. This tree planting is on my mind quite a lot. Um, and I think, you know, we've had, it's been an interesting year at Council. Um, we've sort of been playing a bit of a game of catch up for a year. But there are a lot of things that, that are slowly emerging uh, and there's, I believe, quite a bit of interest in tree planting, and we're working towards, as, as Councillor St. Jean mentioned, having some good policies in place to actually support um, some strategic efforts to protect our natural world. I agree with you about much of what you said. I don't know any of the history particularly that you were referring to, and I prefer to just focus on what we can really get done going forward in the future and 
you know, trying to maintain a positive outlook that we actually can make a difference and working with the community to focus on what is possible is, I think, um, a great step and not so much focus on what's happened in the past and really look at the possibilities. And I understand you're working with Quinty Conservation I'm, I'm imagining, because you referenced the 50, 50 million tree program, you're working with Quinty Conservation and you're in good contact with them. So are we, and I hope that we see some, some um, great products of that relationship going forward. But I thank you for your efforts. It's great, thanks. Welcome. Councilor Margeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Jen, thank you. Just so I'm clear, are you asking for $20,000 for tree planting on a property that you own in just just to get to the details of what your ask is if you can just succinctly summarize that for me that would be good okay so i have a farm 165 acre farm i am starting off with six acres that i am donating to the county sustainability group to do this project the trouble is is it's right now it's a hay field so first of all, we have to hire somebody to cut that and make it so that it's plantable. We've got to have, I, I refuse to use Roundup or any chemicals, so it's an extra amount of work with a, with a small cultivator because if you put chemicals down, you don't need to, to do it uh, you know, manually. But I have volunteers that are going to be out there looking after them. We need the tools. We need to have water tanks to be able to fill up. We need to have George come out and fill up the water tanks so we can water the trees and maintain them. Uh, the wildflowers, which again is replacing the loss of the large meadow, uh, the seeds are very expensive. Um, it would be several thousand dollars just for the wildflower and wild grasses seeds. And that's going to be in an area uh, a little bit separate from the trees, which will be about a two acre piece. That's going to need the same care. It's going to need to be uh, cultivated and looked after. and. Again, there's, a, there's actually a bit of a ditch that I have to have filled so that we can drive across it to get to the field because I don't think everybody's cars will make it. Um, I'm willing to donate the materials, but we're gonna have to hire somebody, Fennels or somebody, to actually do the work. So I'm just roughly estimating, and we need an office there because part of the 50 million tree program says you have to keep track of every single thing that goes on there. So any day you go out there and look at the trees, if you water, do anything, you have to keep track. So we need an, an office, which I am donating a 42-foot uh, truck back for an office. So I'm donating as much as I, as I can, but I can't afford to do it all. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Mayor Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Thanks, Jen. Um, I was going to ask the same thing Councilor Margotson did, except the number of $1,800 came up. What, what was that? That was for the what has to be paid out for the trees. For the, the trees themselves. Yeah, they're about 50 cents a piece, and there's 3,000 okay. trees. Mm -hmm. So they fund most of it, but that's the remaining amount that has to be paid for by myself or the County Sustainability Group. Okay. Um, second part is, if I may, um, we've established the Environmental Advisory Committee, and this is something that should be presented to them. First meeting was held yesterday, so I would I would suggest that um, talk to the clerk about getting on to an advisory, the Environmental Advisory Committee agenda, to update them about this initiative, because they will be able to make recommendations to council as to how this could move forward. Okay. And I think it's I think it's a great idea, and I, I you know, thanks for for uh, bringing it forward. You're welcome. Okay. Get, get, thanks, Jen. Oh, sorry, uh, Councillor Bolick. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Um, looking at other venues here as well, as Councillor uh, St. Jean suggested that the trees are you're looking at getting the probably saplings is that through the uh, stewardship program of the conservation authorities or have you been it's working a 50 with million them? tree program which is all right have you checked with the conservation authority because they've got a stewardship program as well and the other thing i thing i'm thinking uh, from a provincial viewpoint is the managed forest program yeah i've got that in place as well okay thank you madam ceo uh thank you uh chairman i just a point of um fact and clarification, the, uh, in response to the tree 
committee or whatever they're called, um, bylaw committee, we are uh, working on a staff report is tracking for the March 26th Committee of the Whole. Uh, in that report, we intend to um, respond to the recommendations of the group in terms of what a future tree bylaw might look like and how that would influence um, tree planting and tree cutting in both uh, county property and uh, private property. And uh, we are also looking at um, using that report to bring forward, there was a conversation uh, from a previous council meeting about how we could use some of our existing dollars that we spend on trees in, in a um, more collaborative way with the community. We have uh, initiated a partnership with the Conservation Authority for the tree planting program that they have this spring and we'll bring forward some details of how we're going to be implementing that in in the same report so we'll have some more information on that then thank you okay thanks Jen uh, motion to receive mayor Ferguson uh, councillor McNaughton can you read that please um, that the, uh, the Ferguson motion all in favor? Carries. Moves us to 4.2. Danny Solowski to address committee regarding the climate emergency. And you have 10 minutes. Is this on? Yeah. Thank you. Hello, Mayor Ferguson and members of council. Thank you for allowing me to address you. My name is Danny Solowski, 311 Main Street. I come before you today because we have a serious problem and it has to get fixed. I'm referencing the climate crisis, but not the crisis itself. I'm referencing two things, the absence of action on the climate crisis, and even more to the point, the fact that action is being taken against action on the climate crisis. I'm pleading for you to change your ways and lead us through this emergency that you declared last May. I am scared. I am not scared about the climate crisis because we recognize it and we have the time to solve it. I am not scared about the solutions, even though they will change our society and our behaviors, because they will actually make us better off. I am scared that we do not have the courage in our leadership to act on it. We all know that we have to hit carbon emission reduction targets of 60% by 2030. That is now less than 10 years away. This is the war of our lives. We are fighting a tipping point that, if we lose, will result in nature taking total control over what happens next. A tipping point is that point where the consequences of global heating start to spiral ever deeper and we have no control over stopping it. Our future will be our extinction. It will be the extinction of all life on this planet. There will be no chance for us to correct or reverse it. We knew this was coming for decades and squandered it. This is our last chance. This leads me to the purpose of my being here today. Where is it that we, as human beings, can turn to for the courageous leadership we need to save life on this planet? Our society is structured on democratically elected leadership. We elect leaders to represent us. That means you. It means our local councils, our provincial and federal elected re representatives. It means elected officials across the globe. What are the other options for leadership do we have? There are none. You are the only place we can turn to for leadership, but it is not working for us. First, our emissions are not going down, they are going up. Secondly, time to act is running out. This is a very bad combination. People are not stupid. They can see that combination playing out right in front of them. They are demonstrating, they are raising their voices, they are organizing. Every one of their actions is focused on having you listen and take action. They are all directed at you. But you are not listening, and you certainly are not acting. This is a very big problem. Yes, the climate emergency is global in scope. I'm not singling you out as being able to solve this on the global level. Mm -hmm. Democracy has to work everywhere. It is just your bad luck that I'm here in front of you first, because I live here. It has to start somewhere. And I will propose a simple solution today that you can implement immediately. As you know, I ran in the federal election last fall. It gave me the opportunity to listen to a lot of people, including our young people, our kids, our grandchildren. 
listening to them made two things very clear. First, that they are scared. They do not feel they have a livable future in front of them. Second, that they feel powerless to change the outcome they see bearing down on them. They all feel like that. It is like they're living their lives with this black cloud of despair that follows them around all day and every day. If you have any compassion at all, how can you accept that? How can you ignore their calls to inspire them with hope? It is not just young people carrying this message to you. On January 3rd, an Abacus data poll came out with three very clear data points that underscore what we are all looking for. First, Canadians recognize climate change as a priority that has to be dealt with. Second, Canadians want government to work on it. And third, Canadians want government to not work against it. This is not even a close call. Three quarters of Canadians believe that. Canadians want you to act. Listen to our young people. Listen to your fellow citizens, your neighbours. We expect you to find the courage to represent us. That is why we elected you. But democracy is not working. Let me give you three simple examples covering the scale from global to national to local. Globally, subsidies to the fossil fuel industry just continue and amount in the trillions of dollars. Elected officials continue to funnel taxpayer money to support the very industry that we need to shut down. This is a very obvious example of government working against climate change. Nationally, the purchase, support and expansion of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. This is an infrastructure project purely to expand the market reach of tar sands oil so that bitumen producers can make more money for their products in the world markets and using taxpayer money to do so. Again, government working against climate change. Locally, <coughs> excuse me, Right here in Prince Edward County, we're allowing the dismantling of nine wind turbines that were already built and ready to be commissioned and capable of producing enough power for half the households in the county. It was built without a single dime of taxpayer money. Its dismantling took away all the benefits to fighting climate change and did so by putting the Ontario, ta Ontario taxpayer on the hook for $141 million to take it down. How can any one of us here justify the complete stupidity of this? Obviously another stunning case of government working against climate change. These examples demonstrate governments at all levels actually working against the wishes of the people for government to not work against climate change. That is not leadership and we need to ask ourselves why that is happening and we need to fix it fast. Let me make the point that I also ask you to reflect on. Think about this. If the people recognize the problem and the urgency and they clearly call out their leaders for action and those leaders fail to act, and we run out of the little time we have left, what is going to happen? The stakes are high. It is life itself. Do you think they will just quietly accept it? Accept that you have decided to accept failure? As time is squandered and dwindles away, will they become restless and angry? Will civil unrest be the result? They already know how to organize. They're skilled at social media, and they're certainly getting more vocal. And government inaction is certainly making them more frustrated and raising the level of anger. What do you think will happen? I see the scenario of chaos clearly looming in front of us. This is where we are headed. This is very foreseeable. This is the path the absence of democratic leadership is heading us down. Do not get me wrong. I'm not here to advocate for a path of chaos. I'm pleading with you to avoid it. I propose and request the following to restore our faith in you to represent, lead, and inspire us. Every meeting you have with anyone in the capacity of your elected office be recorded and placed on the internet. Here's the impact. It'll expose actions against climate change. It will expose incompetence, laziness, and corruption. It will expose special interests that work against climate action. And I'm sure the media will keep, ta keep tabs on it to flag anything that works against the fight we have to win. Put it this way, nobody will even schedule a meeting with you if it has bad intent. Corruption and special interests would not even take root. It will restore public trust in you. It will empower you to succeed. When you run into snags with other elected officials, special interests, bureaucracy, or any other hurdle, we will be there, lining up behind you to help you succeed. 
We know how to organize, to demonstrate, to raise our voices. We will put that to work to support you. We want you to succeed. It is simple to implement. You have the technology right in your phone. You can start tomorrow morning. It does not even require a vote of council. It is an individual decision for each of you. Just do it. It is inspirational. Your example and courage will show the path for democratic leadership everywhere across the province, the country, and the globe. This is a global crisis, and all that is missing is courageous leadership. So, lead the world, right here in Prince Edward County. The hope that our kids and grandchildren are desperate for will take hold. They will support you. That black cloud of despair they carry around will disappear, and a ray of hope will take its place. We know what we need to do. The only thing stopping us is the absence of courage to lead us through it, to act on it. It just takes courage. For the 266 days since your climate emergency declaration, I have walked out my front door and not seen a single change. You got a minute we have left. an emergency with no action taken to address Danny, it. Danny, you got a minute left. Our house is on fire. You know it, I know it, we all know it. And time is running out. For those of you that are desperate to cling to the status quo and would reject the simple solution, I have one question to ask you. What have you got to hide? You may dismiss this by thinking I am Looney Tunes. Well, a lot of the times I am, but not this time. It is not even my idea. It is Elizabeth Warren's idea. She is a U.S. Senator running for president. She was a Harvard University law professor. Nothing loony there. We need you to get in this game. Lead us. Every meeting you have with anyone in the capacity of your elected office be recorded and placed on the internet. Are you in? Fix democracy and everything else starts to get fixed. You all know it in your hearts and minds. Give us some courage, lead us and inspire us. Let's make tomorrow, the 267th day since you declared a climate emergency, be the first day you act on it. Lead us onto the battlefield. We will follow you and let's win this war. Thank you very much. I'm open to any questions. Uh, Councillor Maynard. Thank you. Thank you, Danny, for your uh, presentation. Um, I guess maybe more than a question, just to the comment when you say in the game. I, I mean, I know that we, uh, that this council and many others were maybe a little late to the game on the uh, climate change, but I think that we have begun to set the table, an uh, initiation of a climate change emergency and uh, amping up <coughs> environmental advisory committee, tree planning policy, and we are, or at least I know I am uh, committed to committed to that. And I would just uh, just note that we have an item on the agenda today, 6.1, where we will uh, consider uh, converting all county street lights to LED, which will um, save over 800,000 kilowatt hours uh, a year. So little by little, we, we are trying, and uh, we hear you, and... Um, you know, if we can get some more trees in the ground and make some small changes, then that will be a that will be a good start. Well, I certainly applaud every one of those efforts, but the point is we've got to dig a lot deeper. We've got less than 10 years to go. 60% of all fossil fuel emissions have to stop in less than 10 years. That takes infrastructure investments, new power grids, all right, a massive move away from internal combustion engines in cars. We need all governments to step up, get to our manufacturers, and start producing electric vehicles to replace them. We need to take some drastic steps here. We've got to stop these subsidies to, to the fossil fuel industry. That's completely insane with what we're facing here. And all levels of government need to step up and work together. Consider this to be the same as World War II. We all agreed on a common enemy, we all worked together, and everybody came in. Every individual citizen sacrificed, okay, when uh, restrictions on use of things, what do you call those? Uh, um, 
rationing and all that was put in. Everybody pulled in. Everybody that's an elected official should be speaking the same game to the common enemy, that the public needs to be informed of what we're fighting against here, to bring the public all together on this. And that's what we count on you people to do. You, that's what we put you in there to lead us. Where else can we go? Who do you think all these demonstrations are directed to? If it's not to elected officials, who is it to? Thank you. We'll go to the next question. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Danny. Um, you know, thank you for what I recognize as the, the sincerity of the, of the intention and, and the eloquence with which you put those, those views forward. And, and uh, I think we all see people here, people streaming the passion that you, you bring to the subject. It's, uh, it's to be admired and much respected. I just want to make a comment for those people that are perhaps you know, watching us streaming and, um, and here in the audience, that I, I wouldn't want them to be left with the impression that there's some kind of, you know, the inferences around you know, corruption or ignoring or inaction or chaos or absence of leadership or not in the game. Uh, this council is very much in the game. This council has champions. Uh, the three councillors who are uh, on our Environmental Advisory Committee are champions. Um, this council made sure that there was youth representation on that advisory committee. Did. It also made sure that there was a Quinty Conservation Authority representative on that committee. Um, we have councillors here that are, are uh, walking the talk. Um, not quite walking, but they're carpooling. Uh, you know they're making you know they're making personal commitments. Um, there are councillors here that are, you know, leading a charge on, on you know even the garbage bags that we use and, and promoting and on their own volition outside of council really, uh, clear garbage bag uh, experiments. We've we've passed motions here expressing our strong support for restoring uh, funding uh, that was cut by a provincial government regarding uh, the 36 conservation authorities and in the province of Ontario. Uh, the tree policy has been referenced, but I know that there are councillors around this table and members of our staff that plant trees. I mean, I planted probably a dozen on my own property. Um, so, you know, and I can add to that, Danny, that, that I've been part of a large number of council led by, you know, two mayors now, uh, deputations to senior levels of government and I can't remember one where we didn't raise environmental concerns you know, with those ministers. So it's not to be defensive. It's to recognize that it's, you know, that we are, you know, we are imperfect, you know. But I wouldn't want to leave some of these inferences just lying there. So thanks. Yes. So, so. I, I appreciate what your comments and everything that you're saying. Okay. So, so the I, issue is it's democratic leadership across the globe. And it all has to start somewhere. We don't have somebody that just runs everything, all right? So when I bring up these issues, corruption, incompetence, and all this kind of thing, I'm not necessarily singling anybody out here. Okay, so that's one issue. I mean, I just look at Donald Trump, for example, all right? And we can see what's going on. Okay, this corruption's happening everywhere. I mean, come, in, come on, we're building pipelines where we've got to get off of fossil fuels. It makes no sense. But let me ask you a question. How many of you have actually gone out and even took a look at those turbines that were actually out there? Those were nine turbines cap cap producing enough energy, and all with the private money put into it, okay, enough to power half of the households in this county. The question isn't why are we taking nine down? The question was why are we not putting 18 up? All right, to get there. I mean, these kind of things are actions that we have to take. We have to think big. Okay, I, okay I, we've I, got have a, I have a question for you, Danny. Um, and I don't mean to cut you off, but it just, um, you made mention that every meeting needs to go on the website and the internet, but I think, are you talking about the council meetings and the committee of whole meetings? Because I, I'm, I believe council, are, I'm count, talking about every elected official. If you're elected into the chair that you're sitting in, put it on the internet. You know how, how low the trust of the public is in elected officials right now? I'm just trying to. No, I know, but I'm just trying to understand. You mean so? If I go to meet with you, you, yep. you want me to video it? Absolutely. Okay. And if I had any ill intent of that meeting or something that I was going to, that was 
not in the public interest, I wouldn't even ask you for the meeting. Then it would basically nip it in the bud before it even took root. Okay. Thank you. Can I have a motion to um, receive Councillor Margaretson and Councillor Roberts? Margaretson Roberts motion that the deputation by Danny Solofsky regarding the climate emergency be received. Yeah, thank you. That moves us to 4.3 uh, students from Prince Edward Learning Center P, uh, to address committee regarding food security. And before you start, the mayor would like to have uh, say something. Just come up, come up to the podium there. Excuse the redundancy on the computers. Uh, <laughs> thank you for your patience. Pioneering something here. So. Okay. Shossi, if you want to just take Just in case. And we're not giving them to you to throw them back at us. Sam, I love you. That's why we did it yesterday. Oh, Just that's sure. good. Oh. Are you guys all set now? Yeah. And you are going to rewire us back into. Oh, 100 percent. I practiced this yesterday. You're going to bring us no back to, problems. bring us back to normal programming. Yeah, in other words. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I saw, I, I saw you yesterday um, um, running through the presentation. Uh, I want to welcome you, um, and thank you very much for coming. Who else is here from the Learning Center? Can you stand up? Let's see how many how many folks are here from the. Oh, great. Well, well, welcome to you all, and thank you very much for coming. Um, we know here and out there that, that um, public speaking is, is a nerve-wracking experience, um, but please, you're, you're here to talk about some very important things, and we're all anxious to hear from you. So uh, again, welcome, and um, start your presentation. We're looking forward to hearing it. Thank you, Mayor, for that good speech you made. 
Good morning, members of council. My name is Bradley O'Neill. I'm a student at Prince Edward Learning Center. This is my second time ever making the presentation to you. Uh, this is my second time ever making a presentation. I'm old doing this over and over again. Uh, uh, this is a shared presentation. I would like it to turn it over to Jonah. Thanks, Bradley. My name is Jonah Shine, and uh, I'm an instructor at Prince Edward Learning Center, and I'd like to introduce our students. You've just met Bradley O'Neill. We have Les Bistricki and Sam Dory, who is also your newest youth rep on the Environment Committee, so congratulations to Sam. We're excited about that. I'd also like to recognize that the County Foundation is here in supporting our work today, so is the Family Health Team, Hastings Prince Edward Public Health, the Picton Food Bank, Plastic Free Prince Edward County, the Climate Resiliency Coalition, as well as you saw other students. We have volunteers from the Learning Center, board members, staff, and many friends of PEC who support our students and the work that they're doing and the initiative that we have uh, today. As you likely know, PELC is a lifelong learning center. We work with adults to help them to meet their learning goals and upgrade their skills for a better life, for employment, to complete high school, or to prepare, prepare for college. We take a holistic approach to literacy to help students to address the many barriers that can make it harder to reach their learning goals. Like many people in the county, many of our students at the Learning Center have low incomes. Uh, they struggle to pay for housing that is unaffordable, and they experience food insecurity. Today we're here to thank you on Council for your commitment to food security initiatives um, in the community and to tell you about the food education project that we've been working on and to ask you ultimately to support our project goals. And that's all you'll hear from me. Oh no, there's more you'll hear from me, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I jumped the gun too yeah, quick. Yeah. Uh, so to, I'll tell you a little bit more, I guess, about our project. In the spring of 2019, with the support of the County Foundation and the Food Collective, we started a weekly food literacy class at Prince Edward Learning Center. And our project goals, have been to raise awareness about food issues and to use this increased awareness to start a community-wide conversation that will transform our food system and make people in Prince Edward County healthier, reduce the harm of food, of our food system on our environment, help to support a local economy that serves our community and helps to ensure that everyone in our community has access to healthy food. So each week since last spring, our students met to learn a little bit more about food and food issues, and we had lively discussions, and we heard from guest speakers, um, and we went on a bunch of field trips, and we saw local farms, and visited some food projects, and I'm going to turn it back over to Bradley to tell you a little bit about some of the trips that we did. Thank you, Jonah. I grew up on a farm all my life. And I love to get out in the county to see local people. Like Blue Wheelbarrow Farm, we met organic vegetable farmer Aaron Armstrong. At Everdeen Farms, Kane Rucker showed us his cattle and milking equipment. At Hagerman's, Jody Hagerman gave us a tour around his, their family farm, showed us the delicious food they produce and sell local. We toured the Picton Food Bank and Shauna Halsey and learned more about their important emergency food programs. We learned about the new Canada Food Guide. We had a great grocery store tour at No Frills with registered dietitian Sarah Sandham of the Prince Edward Family Health Team. We learned about healthier choices and how to understand food and nutrition labels. We heard from great guest speakers like Julie Miller and Debbie Rankin from P Plastic Free PEC who are doing important work to reduce single-use plastics in Prince Edward County. We did some food budgeting and some food hands-on learning as well, cooking and tasting new things. Some of us even tried eating tofu for the first time. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no. Here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> Is the volume up? 
Keeps eating it. That's. <laughs> I like to say he was a very brave uh, soldier. And, uh, it was yeah, really good. We all it tried it. <laughs> Mike Farrell showed us the food hub in Sophiasburg, the new and beautiful commercial kitchen that offers great opportunities for cooking, food production, and food education. The food hub is, hub is currently being used by Food for Share. <clears throat> We visited the Good Food Market in Deserano, run by the Community Development Council of Quinty, and we were inspired to start our own not-for-profit market at Prince Edward Learning Center to sell fresh, affordable fruits and vegetables. We also collected and documented our thoughts each week to bring our ideas to share with you today. Our project is organized into four food pillars. Our first food pillar, food and health, helps us to think about how the food that we eat impacts our health and wellness. Our second, food and the environment, examines how our food choices impact the environment. Our third, food and the economy, considers how our food system could do more to support food producers, local farmers, local food enterprises, and small food businesses. Our fourth food pillar, food and inclusion, reflects on the significant number of people in our community who are left out and are not able to participate or access the nutritious food they need to be healthy. Transforming our food system should matter to all of us. When we look around the county, this is what we see. We live in an agricultural area with an abundance of food, and yet there is much food insecurity in our community. We see many people in our community struggling without the money they need to access healthy food. Whether you're working a low wage job or receiving an impossibly low income support through OW, ODSP, or a public pension, we know that many people are forced to choose between paying for rent and paying for food. According to our public health unit, between 2008 and 2018, rental costs increased by 67.8%, and the cost of healthy eating increased by 43.8%. Our community is very generous and donates much needed food to the food banks, but we also know that food banks alone cannot solve hunger and food insecurity. Food banks can only provide an average of three to five days worth of food per month. For various reasons, lack of food skills and knowledge, lack of time, and lack of money and resources, too many people are eating unhealthy food. <coughs> and so as a result, we spend a lot of money as a society treating diet-related illness like diabetes and heart attacks instead of promoting wellness. Now, the beginning of my life was spent living pretty well carefree. Everything was abundant, and I was blind to the health impacts of what I ate. The excesses of my childhood and early adult diets, rich in fats and sugars, has now taken a toll on my health. Now, quite a few years removed from those days, I'm bound to a regimen of no less than 31 pills every day, as well as insulin and breathing aids. I have developed diabetes, high cholesterol, heart disease, and breathing problems. All of these ailments combined to man this extraordinary number of pills, as well as inhalers and breathing aids, just to stay relatively healthy. Now, wouldn't it be nice if this could be prevented for our younger generations? But our current food system is not working. We see a food economy that serves tourists and drives up food costs for local residents. It becomes clear that our food system is broken when we see that local businesses cannot find workers because these low-wage food workers cannot afford to live in Prince Edward County. 
When we look around, we also see that our food system is very wasteful and unsustainable. Even though there is so much food produced nearby, we import food from far away. This means it takes a lot of fossil fuel and carbon emissions to get this food to us. <clears throat> I have been a resident of Prince Edward County for almost all my life, and most of my jobs have been in the restaurant industry. Working in the service industry for the past 10 years has really opened my eyes to the food issues in Prince Edward County. I've worked at some restaurants with people who are passionate about good food and supporting our local farmers. But the truth is, the restaurants where I have worked are simply not accessible to average folks who live here. I've seen a table of customers as much as one meal as my fiance, two children and I spend on rent for a month. I've seen customers uncork bottles of wine that cost as much as our weekly grocery bill. And I've seen so much beautiful food that has gone to waste. So what do we want? We want a food system that is sustainable, that supports local farmers, food worker, and food workers in our local economy. We want to be leaders when it comes to eliminating waste and protecting our environment. We want good food for all. We want this to be a place where everyone can access the nutritious food they need. We want to live in a healthy community where the food that we eat makes us and our families healthier and stronger, not sicker. Our project has already done important work to help increase awareness about these issues at PELC and in the community. Based on our food education project, staff and students are making changes at Prince Edward Learning Center to change our food practices. And soon, with the, sort, with the support of different funders, including Shire Hall, we hope to open a not-for-profit good food market to increase access to affordable fruits and vegetables for all. And in November, we partnered with Hastings Prince Edward Public Health to host an open house at PELC. We shared our ideas with other folks in the community and helped to get feedback for a public health community food assessment. We know that there are individual actions we can take to change our food choices. But to really make an impact, we know that we will need to work together to change our food system. If we I need could, everyone if I could interrupt all. for just a second. Uh, Bo, how much longer is your presentation? Uh, we've got about three or four more slides. I'd estimate like three minutes. Uh, another three minutes? Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, I'm just doing like a, or I'm probably like the last one to speak, if that's all right. Yeah, we, no, that, that's fine. It was getting close, like you're. Yeah, for sure. So we're we're, uh, just, we're not too much longer. Okay. 31 nope, out of 33 slides. Okay. <laughs> no, that's good. <laughs> I know, we're, we're getting there. Don't worry. Yeah, for sure. We need everyone involved and a system-wide approach to make the food changes we need. We are here today to ask Shire Hall to be at the table. We have a vision for Prince Edward County as a food leader, where we can build on our rich history of food production to become a community that is leading the way on food issues. Building a more sustainable food system will help us to address the Council's priority for 2020 to adapt to climate change. If we take action to address the affordable housing crisis in Prince Edward County, if we build a food economy that really serves our community, if we capitalize on the abundance of good local food, we can make sure that everyone has access to nutritious food. If we can get our rich food knowledge and build our food skills, we can raise the next generation in Prince Edward County to be healthier. We want, <clears throat> we want Shire Hall at the table. Today, we are asking you to strike a working group with municipal staff, councillors, and community partners to work towards a food vision and food strategy for Prince Edward County. PELC is happy to share our ideas for action with this working group, but we want a county-led food action plan and policies that help us realize our vision for Prince Edward County. Other communities across Ontario are already taking action to create food plans. If we can create a municipal food vision, strategy, and action plan, we can set a path toward, forward to ensure that community stakeholders 
<coughs> and policy makers are always working together to use a food security lens to make decisions that create a healthy, inclusive, prosperous, and sustainable community. A Prince Edward County food strategy will give our municipality many ways to take action. For example, whether there is land and empty buildings available in our community, municipal politicians and planners should stay focused on building affordable housing to combat food insecurity. Support more community garden projects and supporting sustainable agriculture, the municipality could also invest in refillable water stations so that local visitors and tourists use few, fewer disposable bottles. Council could introduce bylaws to restrict the use of single-use plastics in the county that would make us an environmental leader in Ontario. We could be known as a green tourist destination with plastic-free beaches. We are excited to see some grocery stores moving away from plastic bags, but if we had council bylaws, we would, could ensure that all county retailers stop using plastic bags. Perhaps more contentious, we could ban through drive throughs in Prince Edward County. This would get people out of their cars, make people healthier, reduce food waste, and support vibrant main streets with thriving cafes and restaurants. Councils could do more to help raise awareness about how people can access food, banks, and meal programs. Perhaps the county could create a levy on tourists to generate revenue to support local food programs. Maybe you could work with our business improvement associations to create a local P Prince Edward County card that could provide a discount for locals to purchase food. Shire Hall could create food procurement, procurement policies to ensure that the thousands of dollars of public money we spend each year go to support local food programs that are healthier and more sustainable. And that all food contracts are tendered only to projects that set targets for local procurement, provide nutritious food, and reduce food waste. Lastly, we hope that Council will continue to make investments in key anti-poverty tools like supporting Prince Edward Learning Center to expand our financial empowerment programs so that we can offer free tax filing and benefit screenings for more people across the county. Today, we are asking you to strike a working group that will look at these and other new ideas. We want a Prince Edward County food strategy that will make us a food leader in Ontario, that will make our community more prosperous, healthier, more sustainable, and more inclusive. Now, if you wouldn't mind, I'd just like to say that uh, how important being a dad is to me. That's what brings me here today because it's the most fulfilling part of my life. I owe it to my kids to do the very best job I can, and then this is the most like <clears throat> this is the best I can do. I do my best to make sure that we lost that we eat less processed foods, and I've already taught my eldest daughter at the age of four about where our food comes from beyond grocery stores. And it's my number one priority to make sure my kids grow up healthy, and it's all of our jobs to make sure that they have a future to live in. Thank you for your time today. I'm just going to start dismantling. Thank you. And we have a, we have a question, a, a couple questions. So, Councillor McNaughton, if you want to go first. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, thank you very, very much for that. I, I was uh, privy to an earlier incarnation of this presentation and I was very glad to be, uh, to have that opportunity and it's evolved beautifully. And it's been really exciting for me. My 11 year old is sitting in the next room right now because it's strike day and she, mama, she came to work with mama, which is awesome. Uh, I'm, uh, all the decisions I make in my life also center around the kid in the next room, uh, who, if she knew I was talking about her, would hate me right now, but that's okay. She might hear me. Hi, Nora. There's a mic near her, or a screen near her. Um, it, it's so interesting when you're part of a system, like a food system, like walking through the grocery store, you don't even see the system around you, and it takes a presentation like this to shake me out of that status quo bias that we all carry 
and and it gets me thinking. So this is the type of presentation that, uh, and having been in contact um, before, that did get me thinking about our food system and did get me thinking about what we used to have here in a more local cyclical economy that uh, that is not out of reach for us, and it started getting me thinking about what we could be looking at, whether it's year-round food production with sustainable greenhouses, where whether it's finding a way to invest or find investors to bring back canneries so that we've got ways to process the good food that we're producing like like we did once, like this was, you know, the breadbasket for Ontario and and still is in certain ways, but could be again in a very vital way for the small cities around us and our own region. It's exciting to think about some of the possibilities and try to actually envision how how we could take steps to see some of those larger visions happen while we implement some of the um, much more easily attainable um, proposals that you've brought forward. Some of them are very uh, interesting and attainable uh, and fit in so well with that housing component that concerns so many of us at this table and is a constant um, constant source of, um, of uh, well, it's a constant topic of conversation for us sitting here. Housing is, is number one, I think, at the top of many of our lists of priorities. So thank you for bringing that. And um, if, if you, hey, and if there's ever an opportunity to participate in what you're proposing, I would love to support or be a part of it in any way. Councillor Roberts. Thank you for the apple. <laughs> um, Locally grown. You know, uh, one of the great joys and benefits of being on council, there are many of them, um, uh, is having, uh, is being able to experience presentations like this uh, from the Prince Edward Learning Center. Um, you are uh, collectively uh, great ambassadors for the Prince Edward Learning Center, uh, and that center does great work in our community, uh, and it was a great presentation. Um, uh, I also appreciate the honesty and the candor of your presentation. Um, and I'm looking forward to that good uh, food market. That sounds like a really uh, interesting initiative. Um, I am getting to a question, but before I get to the question, uh, I, would, I hope I see more of you here. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's important for Prince Edward Learning Center and the people who are involved with the center to keep our feet to the fire on issues of food insecurity, affordable housing, and as has been raised here a few times recently, you know, our overall community well-being. Uh, we need to get some, uh, some metrics on that, but, but you keeping the pressure on us will get us to that place mm -hmm. of having metrics. So my question is, um, I, I, I hear you about wanting to uh, strike a, a working group and, and engage and involve Shire Hall. How does that jive or fit with or contrast with uh, what we've already launched, which is the Prince Edward County uh, Food Collective Initiative. That, that, that initiative does involve the Prince Edward Learning Center. It does involve staff from Shire Hall. Uh, it does involve food to share. It does have food banks involved. Uh, it does have the county foundation involved. Um, uh, from the county food hub in Sophiasburg, we've got Mike Farrell working on it as your contact point. And I think we're all looking to figure out, you know, when do we get that feedback in from all that research and public consultation? And hopefully some of what you're talking about here is going to come to us uh, through that initiative. But I just want to, for my own purposes, I can be for all our purposes, understand what you're asking for here and compared to what is going on at the moment. So I can try to take that question. So. Um, I think, like, first of all, the project has really engaged people around the community, and I think there's a lot more work to do. So people are excited to talk about food issues. It's a, it's a point of entry for people to talk about all the kinds of things we're talking about. Uh, everybody has an experience of food. Um, so it is a great engagement tool, and we've really been happy with our partnership with the Food Collective. It's a, it's a really dynamic group that's doing really good work. 
What we're asking you today though, and we appreciate you hearing from us, but it's not just to say that we did a food education project. We actually want policies, right? So we, we don't just want food initiatives. We want the county leading the way. So we want a working group and that should engage. We hope it will engage members of the Food Collective or the Food Collective, but we also want staff time from uh, the municipality engaged in that. We need, you know, we're doing, like our students have busy lives. You know, this is a little project that I work on at, this, at the Learning Centre. We want this to be a focus. We believe it should be the focus of the county. So we want uh, dedicated resources from the municipality to work on this. Uh, but also to do part of that engagement work because we think that we have some good ideas. You've heard some of them. There's a lot more good ideas out there um, and we want those ultimately to turn into policy. And so we're hoping that that working group can consult with council, that can consult, consult with the committees, that it can meet with Sam's environment committee and from an, get environmental impact about what a more sustainable food system would look like. But also if there's a health committee to talk about what is a public health strategy when it comes to food look like? How do we bring that into our schools? How do we make sure that every organization that serving food in the community uh, is looking at things from a public health perspective. There's tons of work that can be done and that that working group will engage the community, engage council, engage staff, um, but then ultimately report back with some concrete, like you've heard our recommendations, we don't expect you just to accept them off the floor even though we think they're pretty good. Um, you know, we want, we, we want you to think about what could be done and then to actually move forward with some of those things. Um, so, you know, we can, we can imagine a future where H.J. Uh, McFarland has a local procurement policy, right? Where our rinks are not serving, where we're not spending another dollar for, you know, to put another plastic bottle out into the community. Like these are these are our ideas, but we would like, you know, that recommendation to come out of the Environment Committee, for example. Okay. Does that answer your question a little bit? Thank you, yeah. Councillor Forrester. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good presentation, guys. Sam, nice to see you again. It's been a while. You too. I know it's been a bit. <laughs> I didn't even know you had kids now. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, Esther, listening to Councilor Roberts talk. We've had presentations from The Rock, reaching from Rainbows, the Learning Center. Brian comes all the time, talks about vital signs. You know, last week we sat down at uh, the CEDC meeting, so Todd, I'm coming to you here. <laughs> You know, it's interesting hearing all the groups with all the ideas. And one thing I find over and over again, that council dabbles in all this stuff and we play in it here and there, but having this more complete vision. And, you know, I looked at this from the CDC group and looked at their value. And when we started talking about the rock last week and how to bring this out and working on one project and where this would lead to, to a much greater Results and what I hear you say, you want somebody to look at this. Everybody talks about food insecurity. Every talks about uh, the housing problem, uh, continued education for our youth here. And I guess years ago, I sort of looked at the CDC as sort of being a vision group where they would look at bigger problems and come to council with a vision or an idea that we don't always have time to work on around this room here. So, Todd, I think I'm going to be coming to you afterwards and. Uh, this is something that I'd like to bring to the meeting next week and to start working on one project, but it brings in everything because it ties into the environmental groups, it ties into tree planting policies, but something that we could really look at and bring all these groups together and get the resources and come up with a, a common plan that would maybe solve this. No, it, we're never going to solve all of it, but move it in the right direction but with a focus group of people instead of being off and trying to fix 20 things we bring in some of these groups say, here are your common problems, how do we work towards fixing this, and then bring it to council for solutions. Because a lot of times, we're putting resources all over the place, trying to help out just enough, but maybe not quite enough to really fix the problem, so. Todd, we'll, we'll talk about this next week. <laughs> so, Madam CEO, or Madam Clerk, um, just from what I'm hearing, and from what they're asking, um, would it be a good time to make a motion to have uh, the staff bring a, a report back on this? Uh, to the chairman, yes, I think that that would be inappropriate. We can uh, speak to the specific ask and also um, uh, some of the alternative ideas that have been raised and, and generally um, how we can move forward on a number of the initiatives. There's a lot going on. I think it's worthy of a, a staff investigation. Councillor Prince and I believe is going to make that motion if we can get a seconder. Yeah. <laughs> Councilor Margerson? 
Do you have a question or no? Well, we'll just we'll just read that. We'll do this motion first. Can I do the motion. Uh, how do you how, how do you want to do it? Through you, Mr. Chair, I'll make it uh, a double motion just to receive the deputation and that the request from the Prince Edward Learning Center be referred to staff for a report. Good with that? Yeah, perfect. Good with that? Did you have a question or no? No, no, no. You have a question for the deputy or? Okay. Well, before the motion, just ask the question of the deputy. This will be the last question of them and then we'll vote on the motion. Oh, over there, okay. <laughs> You'll be the last one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your deputation and um, and for really bringing to light that we, um, and to kind of add on to what Councillor Forrester said, because we have a, a really vital group of uh, community organizations, volunteers, but I think, I'm hoping what might come from from a, a more fulsome staff report is, you know, how do we, um, I mean, we don't really want duplication of services, but we want a focused, a focused, a a coordinated and, and focused approach. So I'm hoping that that's what will, and I'm, I'm, because you've touched on other, on other areas other than just food insecurity, just ask if that's kind of what you're looking for so that we have a overriding, somebody to take the lead and to, um, to coordinate the activities that all these wonderful organizations and volunteers are already doing. I'm not, uh, I'm, Mr. Oh, oh, did you have a, you yeah. want to reply to that? Sure, yeah. I, I'm not sure that we're asking for something that would last forever. It is a, it's a working group that would make specific re recommendations to council on a food strategy and then food, the council, I assume, would decide which of those it wanted to uh, take forward and again it would engage all the good networks that have been created all the good stakeholders and it's specific around food issues though so the rock should definitely be at that table um, you know the food bank should be at that table like the community members should be at that table but with recommendations for a food strategy and as Les said there are food strategies in other municipalities um, so it would be a short-lived committee and it's not duplicating service I don't think it would duplicate anything that's going on at this point it would more harness you know we'd like Councillor McNaughton's daughter to be at that table from her local school, for example, um, if that was possible as well. Okay, Mayor Ferguson. This will be the last question to the deputy. And then. Uh, thank you. Can I speak to the motion, or are we doing that after? Uh, if you got a question for the deputy, then ask that. If not, we're going to okay, question to the motion. I, well, I sort of have a question, but it's more a thank you. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, guys. Bradley, I see you were in a lot of those pictures. <laughs> but, but thank you for the, uh, the presentation and the, um, I, I really like the idea. And I'm going to talk to the motion that's been, been floored. Um, my concern is making sure that um, items that impact our community do, do not fall through the cracks. And we have several food insecurity and food issues is, is uh, one of those things we really have to keep in our crosshairs on a daily basis. But thanks a lot for coming. Um, you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. So we've heard the motion. I kind of screwed up a little bit. But <laughs> Through you, Mr. Chair, in consultation with the CAO and staff, uh, we'd like to just reread the motion uh, to be more specific. Okay. So it'll say that the deputation be received and that the request of the Prince Edward Learning Center regarding moving forward on a food security strategy be referred to staff for a report. And in that report, the request for a working group will be addressed. Yep. Okay. Any questions on the motion? Councillor Roberts. Um, just a, 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 an observation for staff as if this motion passes and the report comes forward as we expect that there's a word that we don't use very often that pulls all of these issues together these issues of food insecurity affordable housing literacy county kids reads for example community wellness youth rock the word is poverty and uh, it has more elegant descriptions, income disparity, et cetera. But I would, you know, we have collectives for each one of these other things that are subsets, 
but the nut of the issue is income disparity and poverty, and I hope that um, we can do some thinking about that. Thank you. Mayor Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, just speaking to the, uh, the motion and, and the report coming back from staff, which I fully support, um, I think we have to, um, we're pretty used to the way in which the recommendations that might come forward. I would ask staff to be um, particularly thoughtful about new and innovative approaches we can take to tackle the, um, the issues that we've spoken about today so that they, um, they remain front and center of uh, council consideration and deliberation. And we've got, uh, we've got housing, we've got poverty, we've got food insecurity, and there are any number of others, but we need to cast a lens on this to come up with some um, innovative approaches, which I, I would assume staff would normally do because they always come back with brilliant reports. Um, but to, to come back with, you know, to think about this possibly outside the box, in different ways outside the box, because it's, it's something that um, is, is very important to our community and certainly important to Council. Thank you. Okay. All in favor of the motion? Yes, Gary. It moves us to item five, which is comments from the audience. Anybody in the audience wishes to, okay, just um, come up to the podium, state your name, the agenda item, and you have three minutes. Hello, my name is Angela Lamas and I'm speaking to items 4.1, 4.2, and 4.3. I agree with and support the heartfelt deputations made by Jennifer Ackerman about trees and Danny Shalowski about climate change and the amazing deputation from the Prince Edward Learning Center, which I knew little about until now. On Sunday, January 26, 2020, a TV program called Sustainable Energy had a segment on the city of Berlin. Berlin has what they call city trees that are moss, cu moss cultures on walls of buildings which absorb black carbon from vehicle exhaust and factory emissions. So trees do make a big difference in cleaning up human-made pollution. Also on the Sustainable Energy program, they talk a lot about wind and solar. There's an ad on TV for a Volvo electric car showing a young girl looking out her window at wind turbines and smiling. A futuristic movie called Tomorrowland shows the portal back to present Earth opening up and the first thing they see is a wind farm. But sadly, the answer, my friend, is not blowing in the wind in Prince Edward County to help stop climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Any questions? No? Nope. Thank you. Uh, next one. Uh, I'm Don Ross and I live in Milford uh, with my wife Heather since 1980 and uh, we're both members of the County Sustainability Group. I came today to talk in support of uh, 4.1 and 4.2 but after hearing 4.3 uh, they speak so much to what the County Sustainability Group has been about for 15 years. When I retired 10 years ago I dug up my lawn and plant garden, donate food to food knob bombs, collect seeds for CD Saturday. Uh, everything they're talking about is so important so uh, please consider that seriously. Um, I'll try to be quick. Uh, I think the inspiring wisdom found in this old Chinese proverb applies to the deputations you've heard today, all three of them. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. I choose to avoid people who find excuses for inaction or point fingers instead of looking into the mirror, or who say things can't be done then stand in the way of the very people doing those things. I prefer being with people who come up with 10 reasons why we must do something instead of 10 reasons why we can't. I simply ask any skeptics and cynics I encounter these two questions that our children and grandkids are asking us now and probably will be forever. What did you do once you knew? And how did you allow this to happen to us? We can't get back the 50 years our generation has wasted since the first Earth Day warned us about the harm we were doing to the mother nature or the 48 years since the Club of Rome warned us that infinite growth on a finite planet was not sustainable, or the 14 years since Al Gore brought an inconvenient truth into the mainstream consciousness by warning us of what was going to happen if we didn't address climate change 
and has clearly been happening all around us far more rapidly than expected. Over the 20 years since the county had our chance to lead Ontario into the 21st century with clean, renewable energy, but has chosen to stay in the 20th century instead. Those were all the best times to have done the right things, even if inconvenient, but the second best time is now. The status quo unfortunately has prevailed and those forces that have resisted change have brought human civilization to the brink. Maybe you've heard of the doomsday clock set each year by a respected panel of scientists and Nobel laureates since 1953, the year before I was born. It's gone from 17 minutes before midnight in 53 to 100 seconds before midnight now, just set in January. Originally designed to highlight the dangers of nuclear war during the Cold War and the ongoing risk to mankind that still exists from that, it's been accelerating far more rapidly towards midnight each year due to the additional risks of climate change. When wise elders like Sir David Attenborough and young leaders like Greta Thunberg tell us we have less than 10 years to act with wartime urgency to save civilization, we'd be wise to think in terms of the doomsday clock and our 100 seconds to midnight. You got 30 seconds. Even the world's central banks have warned us of an impending financial crisis far greater than 2008 due to the risks from climate change that are uninsurable and unhedgeable. Council today is being offered this opportunity to participate in something positive and nourishing for our world and we welcome your hand, help in planting some hope by supporting this tree planting project. Whatever choice you make, it's still going to happen and I know my wife and I will be out in those fields tending to the seed, seedling trees over the coming years as they grow into a mature carbon trapping, oxygen giving forest. My hope is that before we die we'll be able to sit together with our children and grandkids under the canopy of trees not far from our home in Milford. Regardless, we're guided by this Greek proverb. A society grows great when old men and women plant trees whose shade they know they shall never sit in. Thank you for your serious consideration of all the comments being made today. Thank you. Any questions? Nope. Oh, the next one. My name is Donna Lowe's and I'm here to represent the Prince Edward Family Health Team as a registered dietitian and to speak in support of the Food Insecurity Initiative. Um, I spend all day long talking about food with residents of Prince Edward County and I can really speak to the impact that food insecurity has on my patients every day. Uh, we often think about uh, McDonald's versus apples in a simplistic approach to talk about food insecurity but it comes down to kids managing ADHD through dietary changes, older adults trying to stay healthy and active in the community, people trying to carb count with their insulin. There's just such a range and depth in terms of nutrition and it really does touch all of us um, and it's a topic that is hard to address sitting behind a desk. Um, it's really so much more than what I can teach in my capacity and so that's where we have to turn it over to projects like that to be able to address the rest of the things that are going on in their food environment to support their health. Um, and so I think that this really is the next step beyond what we can do as healthcare providers and it would make a world of a difference in terms of health, not just today, but it's 15 and 20 years down the road for our, our residents. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Nope. Next one. Hi, my name is Sophia Fega and I'm representing the community group Plastic Free PEC. We're here to also support PECL's food education project. Specifically, they're investing in public water stations and introducing bylaws limiting the sale of single-use plastics. Right now, we have, as a community group, purchased a mobile water station, which we've been able to bring around to events in the summertime uh, to promote people not using plastic or not uh, uh, buying plastic water bottles on site, but we need to do more. We've recently put in a community uh, grant application to buy a, a permanent water station to put in in Picton, and these are the types of steps in al alongside what PECL is doing with their initiative to try to promote and provide people with options other than plastic to, uh, to be able to bring around water bottles for tourists and for locals. Thanks. Uh, yes. Thank you. Any questions, Councilor McNaught? Hi. Hi. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, uh, has just this is a, sort of regarding your role on Plastic Free PEC. Have any of your group discussed bringing uh, a bylaw forward to Council or to the Environmental Advisory Committee? I believe we've been in touch with the Environmental Advisory Committee. Uh, so that's the place we're at at the moment. We haven't put a bylaw forward yet, though. So we'll be seeing you soon, then. Thanks. 
<coughs> any, any other questions? Thank you. Next one. <coughs> Hello, my name is Annette McIntosh. I'm speaking to items 4.1, 4.2, and 4.3. I support Jennifer Ackerman's and Dan Chalofsky's deputations. I thank Jennifer for sharing the video by Greta Thunberg. I also thank them for their passion for the environment. And that, and that was a great deputation by the Prince Edward Learning Center, and I hope council support, supports them. The tofu vid video was pretty funny. <laughs> I would like to thank the recreation, Picton Recreation Department for the decision to cancel the fireworks. I read their excellent letter in the Picton Gazette and the editorial supporting their decision. I know that it was a difficult one for them to make. I know some people will be angry about this decision. I enjoy fireworks too, but I realize we are living in a new reality and that the status quo is ruining the planet. The children will understand when they are told that the fireworks are bad for the planet. Kids are pretty smart. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions? Nope. Thank you. Next. So my name is Don Wilford. Uh, I'm part of a group called the Climate Resiliency Coalition. We're here to speak on, on, in support of 4.3, the presentation by the Learning Center, which I thought was outstanding. Um, a bit about us. We believe it's too late to avoid the effects of the climate emergency. What we need to do is try to build a resilient community. We're therefore organizing a symposium, preparing for the climate emergency on Saturday, May the 9th. Um, based on what I've heard today, I've torn up my remarks, so I, I'm extemporizing. The climate emergency is not just about the environment. It's about everything. It's about our, our security systems our energy system, our food systems, our shelter systems, uh, the natural world, and in the end, the way we govern ourselves. So the students at the Learning Center have looked into one of our security systems, the food security system, and they've pointed out the links to our health and our, our, economic, our economics, the way we live. Um, They've shown that there are problems, food security problems, uh, that we're living with today. So imagine how these problems are all going to get worse as the climate emergency hits. That's the point about the climate emergency. It's not just about the environment. Everything about our lives is going to be stressed by the climate emergency. So at the end of this, I was going to encourage you all to listen carefully to what these students have said. Uh, I think it's important. And what I've seen is that I don't have to say that because you have listened. Uh, so thank you for being a great counsel. It's been actually an, an inspiration to see your response to the presentation. And I warmly applaud you for it. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions? Uh, Councillor McMahon? Thank you. What was the name of your group again? The Climate Resiliency Coalition. And your symposium on May the 9th is going to be held where? We're still deciding between either the town hall or the wearing house. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Next one. Hi, my name is Jim Colby, and I, uh, I live on Jane Street out behind the Church of England. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I'm in the Climate Resiliency Coalition also, so I, uh, I agree with what Don said. And I support almost everything that was said to you today by the deputations. But... Um, I'm 75 now, and uh, I have seven grandchildren. But in 1949, my dad ran for, for, uh, for office in Parkdale. And one of the big issues that they faced was they needed more gas stations. Uh, and that was a really controversial one, but it was, it was pretty easy to deal with. Uh, now, uh, I find myself here listening to you, and I wanted to express my gratitude. I think these issues are really daunting. They're really complex, and it's very hard to strike a simple solution to these things. 
but it's extremely important that we try and look at them. And I think that in the, in the face of some of the issues, they sound almost science fiction-y, but I'm convinced nevertheless that they're, they're real. So I'm very grateful that this council is trying to absorb this and move in directions that are helpful. I think it's not an easy time to, to sit where you're sitting. And I'm really, really grateful for your attention. And especially to the people who are less fortunate than I am. And there are many of them around. So um, let me just say thank you. And I hope you can carry these initiatives forward. And I'd also like to say that's a really nice mala. <laughs> Show him the mala. It's really great. Hold it up. There, it's on his hand, see? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Any, any questions? Nope. Oh, Thank you very much. Congrats. Okay. <laughs> Next one. Hi, my. Hello? All right. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rachel. I'm a registered dietitian at Hastings Prince Edward Public Health. I'm speaking in support of the deputation by the Prince Edward Learning Center. Uh, so Hastings Prince Edward Public Health supports the establishment of a working group to develop a food strategy for Prince Edward County. A food strategy for Prince Edward County would provide direction to guide decision making on how the county and the community can address food issues. We support this from a health perspective because a healthy, sustainable, and accessible community food system is an important resource to ensure community health. So for example, access to nutritious food is a key factor to enable people to eat a healthy diet. People are more likely to meet their nutrition needs when affordable, healthy food outlets are easily accessible. Our 2017 population health assessment found that 40% of Hastings Prince Edward residents uh, did not meet the 2007 Canada's Food Guide recommendations for vegetables and fruit. The evidence demonstrates that living close to fast food outlets is linked with lower quality diets, obesity, and other health conditions, whereas living near a supermarket has been linked with eating more vegetables and fruit, healthier diets, and lower levels of obesity. So our research has shown that there's public support to address access to healthy food in Prince Edward County. In the fall of 2013, the Hastings and Prince Edward County's Healthy Communities Partnership conducted a situational assessment to learn more about the readiness of, of um, sorry, to learn more about the readiness and support of residents and community stakeholders to pursue new municipal policy related to healthy eating. As part of the assessment, we surveyed 97 residents of Prince Edward County. And we found that 75% agreed that Prince Edward County should limit the amount of unhealthy foods available at municipal buildings and increase the amount of healthy food at these places. 67% agree Prince Edward County should make it harder for fast food, at, fast food restaurants to be located near schools. So municipalities can improve the nutritional health of their communities by, making, by helping to make the healthy choice the easy choice through municipal policies, initiative, and community design. For this reason, Hastings Prince Edward Public Health supports the establishment of a food policy or a working group to, a, to develop a food strategy for Prince Edward County. Thank you. Yes. Hello. My name is Richard Jones. I live in Demerestville. I just wanted to basically show my support for, for 1, 4, 2, and 4, 3. They were all well presented cases. I, I, I know you guys know that without me saying that, but I just feel obliged to come up and speak again about that for a second. I uh, belonged to our hospital group down here for uh, 11 years, worked there in maintenance, and fought tooth and nail to keep our hospital independent when the amalgamations happened. One of the things that really struck home to me was, you know, we used to buy produce from our local farmers, meat, vegetables, all kinds of stuff. And along came the amalgamation and the first thing they did was they shut down all that and we had prepackaged food brought in for everybody. 
And you know, they tried to explain how more economical it was. Well, what they didn't know was that I actually had access to the budgets, used to do the budgets <laughs> involved for Picton Hospital, so I actually knew the numbers of how much we spent and how much we made and how much we were gonna spend under their new programs. Their new programs cost about 50 to 60% more than what we actually were spending previously. According to their numbers that hit the press and went everywhere else, it was the opposite. So I know you guys have a lot of stress and a lot of decisions to make and a lot of things going on every day about how things go and how they don't go and everything. But I just want to repeat something that my grandfather told me that I think is a really important part when you're going to make a decision. And he used to tell me the biggest thing that you need to remember is if you do nothing, you do nothing wrong. If you do something, pretty good chance you might make a mistake. Own up to your mistakes. Take the bull by the horn and do the right thing when you can. And if you make a mistake, you know what? That's just human. That if you do nothing, that's just bad. And so I just, I just want to reiterate that, that you know, I, I, I've gone to a lot of meetings and I've talked in the past about the fact that you know, drive throughs were the worst thing we ever did. I mean, they were really good for economy for those businesses, but they were really bad for our environment. People drive to go get a coffee. You know, they could just get a coffee, bring a coffee maker to work, you know, whatever. But, you know, they would drive down to Tim Hortons to get a coffee and bring it all the way back to their, you know, some people are smart, they'll get 10, but, you know, most people would just go get one. And then they take that coffee cup, and I had a perfect example of that in Toronto. I just got back from vacation in Mexico. The taxi guy stopped on my tab because he could, because he has headgear that allows him to do that, and let my taxi thing run up. And when I commented, he thought I was discriminating against him. And so he I took his coffee cup, and he drank his coffee, and he threw the cup out the window. And he took his muffin, and he ate his muffin, and he threw the paper out the window. And I, by the time I got done my ride, I was so stressed that I was, couldn't even comment to him. 30 seconds. So I, I, I understand, I understand you guys have those kinds of situations every day that you have to deal with, right? And I, I know that the decisions are difficult, but I just want you to know that I, I respect that you guys, like Danny says, you know, have, have the control, just do what you can, you know, and, and we respect that completely. Thank you. Any questions? Nope. Thank you. Is there one more? Okay. Very quick. My name is Jane McDonald. Um, I'm uh, the chair of the uh, Prince Edward Learning Prince Edward Learning Center board. Um, I just want to uh, speak in, in favor of um, of our deputation. I think it was uh, four three. Excuse me. Um, a few questions from the councillors around how does this uh, working group on food policy? What difference would it? make, how is it different from um, other food initiatives? Um, I guess I just want to comment that to make everyone's life easier, to have a working group on food policy would make those connections for the council, um, for all of us. And we're looking at systemic systems, so systemic breakdowns. Um, and you know, it's in our deputation, it wasn't just about food, it was about poverty and uh, affordable housing. So these are big systemic uh, holistic issues. And I just want to speak in favor of um, striking that working group that will take that um, wide ranging um, view uh, and make, make it easier for all of us. And thank you so much for your support and attention. Thank you. Oh, oh uh, question, Councillor Roberts. Well, Jane. Yes. Uh, just a, just a, I guess it's a compliment. Um, good organizations like the Prince Edward Learning Center are, are even better organizations when they have good governance from their board of directors. So, whatever your board of directors is doing, it's doing a great job. So, thank you very much. Um, we're just one of three legs of the stool: um, the board, the staff, and our clients or our community members, we're really pulling together and it's, I'm so proud to be part of, of this group. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, can I have a motion to receive the uh, questions from the audience, Councillor Prinzen and Councillor Maynard? That's a Prinzen-Maynard motion. We now receive the comments from the audience. 
All in favor? Gary, we'll have a 10 minute break. <laughs> That'll move us on to item six. Uh, items for consideration. Uh, so 6.1 is the report of the Community Development Department uh, regarding proposal to convert all county street lights to LED with real term energy. Can I have a mover and a seconder? Councillor Maynard and Councillor um, uh, Harper. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, could you read it please? Just to get it on the floor. Um, that council receive report CDD 07 2020 for information and two that council approve real term energy's proposal of a cost of $878,417 and that council authorize an Ontario infrastructure loan over 10 years to fund the project and that council authorize the mayor and clerk to sign a letter of engagement that authorizes real term energy to conduct a thorough investigative uh, uh, sorry, investment grade audit. And yeah, at the appropriate time, we'll um, we'll discuss, I guess, an amendment for the for the for the option as well, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll take questions now on the motion as it is. Uh, Councillor Hirsch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, I'd like to say this is a great idea should have done it years ago, except maybe the technology is even better now. So sometimes it's better to be behind the curve and, and get a better job done. So fantastic idea. I have two questions. One is technical. The other is financial. Let me do the technical one first because I think it's simpler. Um, my understanding from studying um, LED street lighting technology is there's quite a wide range of ability to have either sort of, you know, flood lighting or spot lighting or variable direction lighting and so on. Is that kind of what the the consulting aspect of this would determine is, is how we actually want to see um, lights operate? The current ones are just on and they do what they do. So Todd? that's the first question. Uh, through the chair, I'd like to turn this over or introduce Mark Rieg. Uh, he's the field installation supervisor for Real Term Energy, and we figured we might get some technical questions that were beyond our skills and capabilities, and so we asked uh, Real Term if they would send someone to answer your technical questions today. Uh, and so uh, Mark looks very happily to answer that question at this particular moment. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm Mark from Real Term Energy, as I said, a field installation supervisor. Um, I can certainly answer your question. Um, we um, design and engineer um, the lights for each community um, based upon RP8 guidelines, which are um, guidelines for um, illumination on the road and sidewalks and so on and so forth. Um, so that's our biggest thing is to engineer for the RP8 guidelines. Um, uh, we adjust things like the distribution patterns, so how the light is shaped. We um, do the wattage, which is the strength of the, the light. Uh, color temperature, which I've talked a number of times, doesn't uh, necessarily affect um, the distribution, but it, it, it's an aesthetic choice uh, that needs to be made. And so certainly we, we work with you on engineering um, lights for each specific location. So um, we step back using a modeling tool that will show the distribution of the light and make sure that you, you meet your guidelines. So it's not just simply uh, like a one-for-one -one swap or whatever, there's a lot of engineering that goes into it. Follow up. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, great answer. So there'll be some consultation with staff and so on about, about doing that. That's good. Can I move on to my financial question then? Sure. <clears throat> I mentioned this to Todd at the break. I kind of wish we'd seen this last week in the budget um, rather than a week later, however. Um, here it is. My personal preference would be that we do this for cash rather than long-term debt. Uh, the payback, um, according to the report, the payback would either be three years or 3.9 years, uh, depending on which option we chose. Um, that doesn't require a 10-year loan, and by taking out the 10-year loan, that encumbers our, our, um, our debt service capability which we've talked about in terms of potentially using that for roads going forward. You know, we have the McFarland home issue and so on. So I'd like to just throw out the idea, would it be possible to consider um, 
not using long-term debt to accomplish this and use cash instead. Thank you. Todd, do you want to answer that or? Uh, through the chair, I, I, I don't believe, uh, I believe the payback period or the intention of the payback period was to, to shorten it to three to, or 3.9, depending on the type of system that we were going to, uh, we, we would uh, be potentially implementing. I don't think it had a 10 year period, uh, but I could consult with the director of finance on that and get back to you. No, it's un unfortunately, yes, it's 10 years. To the chair, maybe I'll just clarify in case not everyone got that. So basically, we start realizing the operational savings in our annual budget in three to four years, depending on which way you go. But the upfront cost that we are um, uh, borrowing with is on a 10-year cycle because that's the kind of borrowing vehicle we were talking about using. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bailey. Thank you, sir. Um, minor technical question. I'm used to colors from light being either warm or cool. These would be predominantly? Uh, so it's certainly your choice. Uh, we've done different things in different communities. Uh, some communities go with the, with the um, warmer 3,000 Kelvin. Um, some communities go with the, the um, brighter 4,000 Kelvin. Some communities do 4,000 along main streets and in their downtown sections and warmer lights in residential areas. It's really a, an aesthetic choice, and it, it, um, when we present the IGA it, um, at the end, uh, y certainly you guys will have the option of picking whatever you want. Um, in different communities, we've done um, samples, so we've put in three lights of one temperature, three lights of another temperature, had the residents go and look, and you can uh, do a little survey on your, your website and see what residents like, if, if that's something that you would like to do. Um, but really, we, we will work with you. Um, to help you make those decisions. Uh, along similar lines, would the, I read through it, I will be honest, there were some technical aspects that I, are beyond my depth. Um, the smart control system, does that imply that it's adjustable to each area, each circumstance? Yes, each individual fixture can be adjusted with wattage up and down. Each fixture? Each light can be adjusted wow. individually. I was in favor of it before you told me that. That's good. Thank you. Just listen. To that. Any other questions? Oh, Councillor Bullock. A techno weenie question, I guess. So where is the, where, where are the, where is the control situated? I mean, is this a, an online thing or is there one central control? Or? So the actual, um, street light on top instead of a photocell. It's uh, what's called a, a node or a smart node. Uh, it's a, depending on which one you get, some of them are little flying saucer, saucer shapes, some of them are, are just kind of larger photocells, and the, the individual control sits right on top of each light. Uh, then there's a central management system uh, somewhere. Uh, it, it, depending on the manufacturer, it can either be um, through them or, or through a, a server on your own end um, in your IT department, uh, and then that's just how it's managed. Oh, so the question was focused, uh, say there's a uh, police or a fire emergency and they wanted to change the lighting, mm -hmm. would, th would they be able to do that directly? Yeah, or would they certainly. Uh, most of the systems have a, some sort of mobile app or you can do it off your computer or something like that. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Mergerson. Perhaps I missed it. I read this, how long does it take based on our, our number of street lights to make the conversion. And the only thing I saw about annual maintenance was in the graph that you had, where the orange is a lot less in the baseline than it is in the post LED upgrade. Do we, do we or the staff know about the maintenance of this in the future? Uh, so I can start on the, the maintenance aspect, if, you, if you'd like. Um, so as far as the reduction in, in your maintenance costs, uh, they'll come from the fact that um, the in your current system, you have to uh, relamp. Um, some communities do it automatically, like once a year, they'll go out and relamp every single uh, light. Some of them do it on burnout. Uh, LEDs last a long time. Um, they have a 10-year manufacturer's warranty, uh, so you won't be relamping anymore. Uh, so they, 
failure rate on the LED lights is significantly less, so you won't be um, dispatching contractors um, to repair the lights. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, when you uh, work with us on our um, program, that comes with a one-year manufacturer's warrant or a one-year workmanship warranty. So for the first year, any sort of workmanship issues or any sort of problems like that are all covered and and taken off. Um, the smart control system will allow you to reduce your maintenance costs by um, centralizing the dispatch for the um, repairs. So uh, for instance, if you have a light out on 1st Street and you also have a light on 2nd Street, you would then group that together and dispatch one contractor at one time to do that instead of once for one and then another call comes in the next day and you dispatch again or, or whatever, so on and so forth. So the maintenance reductions come from um, reduced truck rolls for things like relamping and for repairs. Okay, uh, you didn't say how long it would take, but uh, following up on that, yep. our operations department, who aren't represented here, are the ones that do the maintenance of, well, they, we contract it out, is what I feel. And um, so I'm not sure the benefits of the centralized system of someone monitoring. I don't know anything about the staff. I think right now our average frequency of burnouts is five years on our lamps, is what they've told me. So this may be something more discussion with operations on the added component that you're talking about, which is the variable. The smart control. Yeah, the smart, smart, I guess, is a good word, yeah. Um, so how long will it take, do you know? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So on average, our uh, crew can install between uh, 25 and 30 lights in, in fairly decent weather. In the winter, it's conditions, it's a little less, probably around 22 to 23 lights. Um, so a day? A day, yeah. So on an average week, uh, a single crew can bang in probably about 100 lights. Uh, you have uh, close to 1,000 lights. Uh, they normally work four days. They do four tens, take the Friday. Um, so if you, if you look at about 100 lights per crew uh, per week, you have about uh, 1,100 lights, so I, I would say 11 weeks with, with one crew. I think Todd had his hand up. <clears throat> Just to respond to the chair to the question regarding maintenance, uh, we've consulted with uh, the operations department. Uh, we've passed the, this opportunity and the report by them to sort of gain some sense, and uh, both the uh, acting director of operations and one of the road uh, supervisors uh, both consented that they would see some opportunity in savings of maintenance. I can't, uh, I couldn't justify what that number was today, but they certainly acknowledge that, and, and you are correct. Uh, our electrical work is done through an electrical contractor. Councillor Forrester. Chair. Mr. CEO, Mr. CEO, would you be looking at uh, we're roughly $150,000 savings per year? I think 1.5 over 10. Would you consider this loan now something you just spread out over 10 years, or would you take those savings and try to pay this off quickly, or just put that back into like an operating capital or a, another capital project we'd be looking at? Um, so without the, and I don't think you know the answer either. So um, without the benefit of Amanda, I might get this a little bit wrong, but I, th I think that the uh, the way it works is that you enter a term with the um, um, the loan, so it's it's so it's set up that we were supposed to be on a 10-year cycle, not that you, it's sort of like your mortgage, you get penalized if you pay early, so they're kind of, um, so I think there's some structural uh, constraints around how you pay back if you get into the 10-year idea, but I think, uh, in talking with um, the director of uh, finance, we were talking about uh, taking these savings and then, yes, plowing them back into other things that could support um, some of the uh, capital reserve or operational. Uh, I mean, there's some definitely some choices next budget if we went forward with this in terms of where we'd want to put those annual savings. And, and it could be that they go into, um, uh, because uh, this is operational saving dollars, if we actually realize those numbers, we, we could also put it back into operational work that is just different work that in some of the other asset lines that we're interested in. Yeah. Okay, and just to follow up, and that's just uh, something I'd want to make sure that if we actually see these savings, if we continue these sort of projects in the future, that instead of borrowing money, we could actually put them in the reserves, what might be for roads or it might be for the arena, but something that we can say, hey, yes, we got this money back and it just doesn't disappear and operations sort of like our old stabilization fund we cut money back and then it just wanders out so 
but that was a good answer. Councillor Harper. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks very much for your um, technical help. I just got a technical uh, question on the smart control. Um, is that something that has to be put in at this stage? Must we know for sure that we want to do it? Could it be done later? That's part one. And the second is what, what percentage of municipalities do go with the, uh, with the smart control? Uh, so it's certainly most cost effective to do it at the time of the conversion because you have a truck there, um, you're, you have a man there in the bucket and um, to enable the smart, the smart technology or smart controls is, is to install the smart node. Um, so the, the greatest cost in um, beyond the, the actual fixture is the labor, is getting the guy in the truck and in the bucket and up to the light. So it's um, in your best interest financially to, to do it now while, while you have somebody there. Yeah, and what's your sense of the number of municipalities that pursue the, um, the smart control? So uh, it, it's um, gaining traction and speed. For instance, um, we're, we just completed uh, Peterborough. They went with smart controls. We are currently installing in Guelph. They went with smart controls. Most of our projects going forward are choosing smart controls. A few years ago, they weren't, um, the control systems weren't um, up to, to spec and speed to, to really um, they weren't working very well, tell you the honest truth. Uh, they've worked out all those bugs and, and they're working much better and the, um, the payback and the uh, control features are, are, are there now to justify municipalities putting it in. Uh, Councillor Prinzen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just going through the, the report that's attached to, to the agenda item 6.1, I see on uh, section four of that conclusion and next steps. So can I make the assumption this is step one um, recommendation from the staff? And then I just, you know, when step 10 says final costing, I just wonder how much this, how much could we be looking at or whether this is final costing? Like maybe I'm reading into it too much, but when you start seeing the steps and then you, and then you see final costing, I'd hate to invest this much time and energy and then all of a sudden step 10 comes its way out and step 12 we're like, yeah, but well, that's not happening no more. So I just want to make sure it's clear before, before we go that far. Um, so if I may, it may not necessarily be a technical question, but um, we've done a, a, a large number of cities and municipalities in, in uh, Ontario, Massachusetts. We've worked in BC, uh, Maine. We've worked in many states and provinces. We have um, very good, robust, budgeting and estimating teams within our, our company, we put together pretty good numbers. We, we're not necessarily over and above um, ever. We're normally under what our um, estimates are. And the reason why we want final costing at the end is because uh, in in that process, we do the, the audit and the GIS collection. Uh, I personally come out and do a, an inventory of your um, infrastructure and check the quality and stuff and make sure that our allowances and make sure what we budgeted in there is correct. So it's just a verification more than a, a, a change point. You know what I mean? Like we're not going to come back and upsell you with something later or, or oh, it's double the cost now or whatever. Um, the, the only reason why that's there is just to verify that that our number is correct. Okay. Yep. So yeah, it's actually not a follow up. It's another question I just thought of. But you talk about the uh, smart controls and most are going that way. Um, how often do you find people changing the settings of the lights? Like, you, you know, we all upsell or we all get the extras, you know, we're going to put this and this and well, you find the setting you like and you never touch it again. Yeah. <laughs> like we all do it and I'm just as guilty as the next guy. So, you know, at the price, price difference you want, if we're going to set them, we're going to go around once with our fancy little remote and change the lights and we're going to go around a month later and change them again and then never touch them. It really doesn't make financial sense in my eyes. I love the lights. I'm 100% supportive. The smart control, I'm having a little bit of a hard time on the sell of that. So if you could convince me, sure. I can be convinced, but go for it. I, I don't know if I can convince you, but I, I can certainly tell you the benefits of smart controls and, and why you would do it as a, as a community. Um, so currently at this moment, um, the hydro companies don't allow you to receive um, savings based upon the dimming that you can do via smart controls. Okay, so when you receive your incentives and you receive your stuff, it's at the, the hard set level that the lights are at right now. So even if you um, say install like a 100 watt light and you take your controls and you dim it down to a 50 watt light, you won't get the benefit from that as far as energy reduction right today. 
that should come in the future as more cities do this and the demand grows that, that you're overpaying for electricity for, for electricity you're not using, they should allow you to start uh, reducing your rates based upon your remote dimming capabilities. So that's one benefit. The next big benefit is that um, remote management and ability to see um, whether a light's working or, or not working and collect up that, that information for, for um, like a one trip visit. There are um, rules and laws around um, that lights have to be repaired, street lights within a certain amount of time and so on. And having um, the smart controls there allow you to um, tell when a light's out or more importantly tell when a light's working. So for instance, if somebody gets into a car accident and they say the intersection wasn't lit up, you now have proof and, and a way to show that that light was working at that time. Um, the other benefit of the smart controls is, uh, for instance, in Auburn, Massachusetts, uh, where we just finished installing, uh, they had a tree lighting ceremony. And so for um, at the start of the tree lighting ceremony, they turned up all their floodlights around their um, you know, their tree in their area got everybody in and then they, they dimmed it down. And they allowed the tree to come up and everybody had a wonderful, you know, romantic experience. And then lights came back up at the end and, and everybody left. Yeah. So there, there's many um, ways you can use it um, for emergency services, for road work if you need more light or, or whatever. There, there's lots of um, additional benefits to having remote control. Councillor uh, Maynard? <clears throat> Can't be, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, through you. Well, last night I had a pretty lengthy conversation with a recent graduate from Loyalist College from the um, Automation and Controls Program. <laughs> and uh, for full disclosure, Rachel does not work for a local company. They do not do, uh, they do, not do automation and controls on streetlights. But um, a lot of what's been said is exactly, I got some of the answers. Um, from her ahead of time and as a county girl she said the um you know the led lights and if you can have some warm some cool you know good idea she talked about because we knew we were going to have a snowstorm that uh, the led lights don't reflect the same off the snow you know you get a better quality of light when you have certain weather conditions but specifically on the controls, she said it's not only that you can respond more quickly to uh, an outage, but that you know the control will tell you exactly what the issue is, whether it's a, whether it's a bulb or the socket or the whatever the reason is, so that when they go, it's a one, it's they're they're going once, and also that the ability to. Um, to add on to the functions of these controls. She said, like, if you do it at installation, the cost is minimal, well, somewhat minimal, compared to going back. She said that the, the um, it's almost endless, the possibilities that will come from these controls. And uh, she actually made the comment that in the last two years, they have really now finally got over that threshold of any issues that they were having with controls. And as a county girl, she said, Finally, we're going to, she said, we're getting into the, you know, into the, uh, you know, the, something that's current. And she said, just tell them to just do it. She said, for that extra money, she said, it is, it will be money uh, well spent. She talked about emergency services, having different types of uh, lighting in different places. If the community doesn't, you know, even after they're installed, if you have a control, you can, you know, dial it down. If a house gets built in a, she said there is, she said this really good, uh, really good proposal. She sent me more downloads on this than I had a, a chance to, I had a chance to read last night. But I'll just follow up on the, on the financing because once they're installed, we will start seeing the uh, energy savings right away. So before I seen this and the went about the tenure, I thought that we would might be better off and like to have a shorter term and that we use those savings to make the to make the uh, to make the to make the annual payments and in the long run save a little interest but i uh, think are you just asking that question you're not going to no, make a motion well, right i'm asking I'm just... that question if if um you know will we have because the motion kind of you know it says a 10 year fund project but when we get all the information back and and can, will we have a chance to look at those options or how do we leave ourselves a little wiggle room if we decide that we would like to have a, a shorter term? 
to more closely match up with the payback with the payback period. We'll let the Madam CEO answer that. <clears throat> um, uh, through the chair, th so uh, this matter has to come to council, so we could do that homework before we uh, go back to council, and if and be able to provide some supplementary information about the borrowing and our options and and how that would work, and then that might inform when this um, committee of the whole motion. Should you pass the motion here, we could amend it when we get to council. Um, that might be one way to do it. Okay. Just as a quick follow-up, because we won't know until we get the audit, the full costs, and you know all the the variables. I just thought when I said that that maybe if we put just in there a maximum of ten years to fund the project, then that might give us some. Can we uh, can we just? Leeway. I got four other ones first, and then you can make. Yeah. A, 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 but I was a, just throwing that out there okay. as a way of maybe trying to find a. Okay, so uh, Councillor Saint Jean. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Extremely concise report. Uh, I have to applaud staff on that and for the work there. And, and and I absolutely believe this is a this is the type of thing we should be doing. It, it checks a lot of boxes. Climate change being one. You know, it, it touches our bottom line. It, it's it's all about saving taxpayers money. Uh, how we go about it, the financing model, yeah, let's discuss that later. Uh, I, I would like to just add some anecdotal data. I live on a street that has six yellow sodiums, four of the current, uh, uh, what are they called, cobra heads. And uh, I was somewhat fortunate to uh, have one burn out right in front of my house, so I now have a brand new LED sitting in my, right in front of my driveway. Uh, there's another one further down the street as well. I have to. I, I do have to say, what an amazing difference! When you when I was out on the street last night looking at all three different kinds, uh, I'm sure my neighbors were wondering why is he wandering in the middle of the street. But anyways, uh, absolutely, I think this is something we we have to do. Uh, I, I just mentioned some of the the the, the benefits. Um, and, I, and I do believe the smart control system is the way to go. I, I, I think they'll be able to prove to us a little better that it is money well spent, because that's what I'm looking at here, money well spent, money saved. Uh, I don't know how many of you went to their, their website, but it looks like 200 cities, 140,000 lights installed, several local communities, Gananoque, Quinney West, have gone this way. Uh, so I think, you know, yeah, as part of the... Next step of research, I guess, I would strongly urge staff to, to reach out to those local communities to find out what their, what was the impact on their bottom line, what, what was uh, the feedback like from the community in general. I th but overall, I like this and I'd like us to move forward and I'd like us to be innovative in a lot of other ways too that uh, I will get behind. So, Okay, Councilor Bullock. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think that my first question was answered insofar as uh, the system, the control system will tell you what's out where and you don't have to send people out to... As far as failure modes, I take it with, an, with regular bulbs, they either burn or they're not. They burn out and then you've got to go fix them. I take with LEDs, unless there's some electronic issue that you've got individual LEDs in the bulb may start going and you get a degraded performance over time. Is that... So uh, what we normally see, the, the typical failure point on the LED is the, the driver inside, the, the part okay. that converts the energy and, and actually drives the LEDs. The, the panels themselves don't normally go bad. Um, the manufacturers put a 10-year warranty on them, so they, you know, they're probably going to last you 15. You know, they, they wouldn't mm -hmm. shortchange on the, on the warranty if they couldn't. Uh, but definitely the, the ballast inside is, is the, or what's called a driver, is, is the uh, most failure point, and the, the failure rate on those is very, very low. And are these like a bulb? Are they easy to change out? Or <clears throat> so uh, assemble them? Uh, the light itself is pretty much, a, it is certainly components, but it, it's mostly just a fuel replaceable unit. You replace the whole, the unit. Uh, you can replace the driver, which again is the part that fails the most, and that is, um, instead of RMAing the whole light, we just get a driver back from the manufacturer's. And how much would one of those heads cost? Uh, the typical Cobra heads about three hundred bucks, two hundred and eighty, three hundred dollars, give or take. All right. Okay. And just one one last bit of information for Councillor Prinzen. That's uh, the difference between control and non-control is twenty-eight percent. 
Okay, so I got uh, Councillors Margeson, Forrester, Hirsch, and Roberts, and then Maynard, uh, Councillor Maynard can make her amendment or her suggestion, and then we'll vote on the motion. So, Councillor Margeson. I just wanted to follow up because the one thing that, the one portion of this that I wasn't completely confident about was the smart control and I understand the benefits potentially I'm not sure how we could realize energy savings in the future because I asked this to some others before because I don't think the lights are metered so how we would but that that's that part of it as, as far as the um, I just wondered if we autom if they're automated do we need is there any staff involved in this uh, as far as the future if there's maintenance issues related I asked about maintenance before on the lights but maintenance with respect to the smart control system so whatever the sensor is on the top of the light and I don't need answers to this now and I thank you for your defense of it I'm asking the staff if if they had a recommendation before council on the smart control based on some of the other issues that come up so we'll let uh, Todd if he has an answer. <laughs> Plus our geography and our street lighting system and other factors that may influence the decision of a... Uh, through the chair, so I, I guess I would, I would say that um, um, having smart controls uh, as it would assist uh, operation staff and understanding where street lights are at. I mean, we have street light systems in uh, a number of different parts of the county, so it's 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 uh, it saves having to uh, dispense a, a crew out to assess that that that's an issue, and then contact an electrical uh, the electrical um, individual to come in and do the work. So I mean, it may save. It gives us a centralization feature so that we can sort of understand uh, from here. Uh, I can't speak to what the sort of sensors or what's required from a staffing perspective to do that kind of thing. Um, it certainly brings us forward into the future in a, in a fashion that we haven't done uh, in the past uh, with, a, with that group. Um, and uh, I mean, it was certainly supported by operations. They felt they would be able to find some efficiency uh, by having sort of access to, to the system as it is. Okay, Councillor Forrester. Thank you. What's that? I'm just looking here at the executive summary and I, I'm good with this proposal, deciding whether to go with the, the smart proposal or just a regular one. That's the only question I have right now. Uh, <coughs> There is a fixture warranty on, I guess, on the bulbs for 10 years. But you did say earlier on the smart controls, they were sort of wonky up until a few years back. What is the warranty on them? And just explain the warranty a little bit to me. Uh, so I don't, uh, each manufacturer, there's a, a number of different uh, manufacturers that we use, and each manufacturer has their own specific warranties. Uh, they would be typically, you know, two to five years on, on the nodes themselves. So that, Right now, we turn on these lights, the LEDs come on. Yes. With or without the... Uh, they're uh, with a photo, uh, like a photo control on top, and yeah. so it's done by, by light when it gets dark. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we have the smart controls that allows us to do... All sorts of stuff. All sorts of things. Yeah. Some people talked about utilizing this in five, ten years out. You know, we can really take advantage of this. But I guess I'm really looking at what is the lifespan and what is... Uh, if an individual smart cell breaks on one of these units, what does that cost? If it's a replacement up to five years, okay, is that good? But if, it, if we have to bring in the local electrician and it's $500 to in labor to fix it. So this is where I'm looking at the cost savings. The rest of it is not a problem. But smart controls, if we can't reach full advantage in five years, then I'd have to say, why would we put them on if there's only a three-year warranty on them? So the... Um as far as maintenance, as the, as the nodes themselves go, there, there's none that I know of. It, it's just a, a photo control like, it, like anything else. Um, it, it requires no special training or, or special tools to install. It, it has the same pins and connectors as a normal photo cell. You turn it in 15 degrees and it locks in place. And uh, so that as far as um, that part of it or, or changes to your maintenance programs or, or needing extra work or specialized tools, n none of that's needed. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, the 
on the back end, of course, there is a little bit more maintenance uh, and, and use uh, to manage your server and to um, manage um, the infrastructure itself. Like uh, when you install a new light, the, you have to put that into your system so that it registers. And there's an, so there is, a, there is a little bit of administrative tasks that you don't have currently, um, but it, it's minimal um, to, to make it work. But just follow up, you're saying so it could be three to five years warranty on this system. It depends on the manufacturer, yeah. But then a 10-year warranty on the bulb. So uh, I, I'm just concerned right now yeah. that there's only a three to five-year warranty on one part of the component, a 10-year. And one thing I've seen when you put in these new type of advancements is that they start breaking and you think, geez, you know what, we're just not going to replace them. And then you lose that advantage. There, therefore, you're that 20% cost disappears rapidly. So I would just want to, this is one of the things if I was looking at to do this, that I would really consider that part of the aspect. If it gives us fr upfront savings right away and we know we're gonna use all these fancy things, but if we're three to five years out from doing it, then I'm just gonna go with the plain, turn them on, turn them off proposal. And I, I don't know that because I don't know all the plans coming from roads and how they're envisioning using these yet or the savings potential is moving ahead. So it's something we might want to consider before we uh, go with Chair, the uh, So I would just also emphasize when we talk about the uh, ongoing maintenance, if we go with the smart control, it is not operations on their own. Think of it like wastewater, right? The whole SCADA system is uh, a heavy partnership between the wastewater department and the IT department, right? So if we go this way, there is um, the the workload um, aspect of this and what we have to do to be ready to make it work is really a shared responsibility across the two departments. It's not going to rest just in the operation department. So, okay. Councillor, what do you think? What would you be suggesting? Because I'm torn between this one here, so I'm not asking you for your... Can, can, can we just... Uh, it's not unfair. I mean, it's not, this is a... So, maybe if I can just, because we have a second, um, this has got to come before council, and maybe um, that would be a fair time to, to ask that. So, we'll, we'll speak about that council there. <laughs> so, Councillor Councilor Hirsch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Comment and question on the smart control issue, coming back to Councillor Prinzen's point. I think it's a, I, I would hope that over the future, uh, reduction in wattage via the smart control will be recognized by the hydro authorities so that we do get the financial benefit. But technical question, some of the reading I did talked about using the smart control system to have um, uh, motion activated control. So you could picture out on some of our country roads where for hours and hours at a time at night, not a single soul goes by. The lights are down to like 10% or 15% of the wattage. And as a car approaches, they come up to, to full power. If that's part of it, he's nodding yes, so I guess that's the correct answer. Um, there's potentially huge savings there, um, as long as that does get recognized by the hydro authorities ultimately. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's a really good report. I'm very supportive and we should get the smart controls. Uh, if for no other reason than just general public safety. I think it was last year uh, I went through an experience in Demarestville where we had five or so street lights uh, that were out. Uh, we had to resort to uh, seniors going out in pairs with flashlights. Uh, to try and find that little silver metal indicator of what lamp pole it was. Uh, we also uh, had people out, we, did, we had to get people out who were walking their dogs at night uh, to delay walking their dog until it was really dark so we could find out what time, I mean, it was just stupid. Um, because contractors would not come out when it was dark to verify the damn outages. So, uh, you know, it's extremely responsible for us to uh, go with the uh, uh, smart controls. Uh, if for no other reason, just, you know, public liability with, you know, grandmothers and grandfathers putting on their coats and going out with a, that's just silly. Um, and, and all of that delayed the installation and repair of the, for those uh, outages by at least eight months. It was nuts. 
Uh, so if we can, you know, if it's an instantaneous identification, that's a lot better than what I had to go through. Thanks. Okay, so I, th I think Councillor Maynard, she had, I don't know if it's an amendment or something, but do we need a motion, Madam Clerk, or is it a friendly amendment? <coughs> friendly amendment, and she is the mover of the motion, so. <laughs> So can you just explain what it is you want? Yep, just in the um, third in the third bullet point, it would just say that council authorized an Ontario infrastructure loan to a maximum of a 10-year term to fund the project. Just putting in the word maximum, basically. So to the Madam CAO, what does that do? What that means is you're giving uh, staff the... Um, Discretion to find the best way to finance it up to, so we would not um, uh, necessarily need to amend that or discuss it at council, but we would look into various options. So we could certainly talk about that um, before we take this to council, but by writing it that way, you're leaving it to staff to come up with the best way to do it. So is the seconder okay with that? Who was the seconder? Harper? He I will. I, I, the, are you okay with the? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Alrighty. Just one final comment. When we when we talk about the um, the controls and maybe not getting from hydro right away the recognition, but just to uh, in the conversations that we've had all day, it's it's not just the immediate uh, dollar energy savings we get, but it's also we will get a uh, we will have a reduction in electricity. And I think that that is also an important, uh, an oh. important consideration. Okay, all in favor? This is oh. What does yeah. message go? Oh, what's that? Here. I never did get the answer from the CAO. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to get it at the council. We're going to let us do over for 10 minutes. Okay, it moves us to 6.2. Uh, report of the Development Services Department dated uh, February 6, 2020, regarding the County Road 3 reconstruction extension. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? I can do that. Uh, Councillor Prinzen is a mover. Seconder? Uh, Councillor Harper. Can you read it, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's a Prinzen Harper motion. The Council receive report DS02 2020 for information and that Council passed the County Road 3 reconstruction extension that council oh sorry that contract 2019 edw-58 be awarded to d kaiser excavating limited in the amount of one million nine hundred eighty two thousand nine hundred ninety five dollars and fifty cents plus all the applicable taxes and that the bylaw listed on the agenda to authorize the execution of an agreement between the county of prince edward and d kaiser Excavating Limited be brought forward to the February 18, 2020 meeting of Council for enactment. A a any questions? Uh, Councillor Bailey. Just curious. Um, 1.9 million for one kilometer of road? Seems a trifle dear. Could somebody explain? I was going to say frugal, Steve, the deer. We had uh, four bids through you, Mr. Chairman. We had, I believe, four bids on this job. This was the lowest. Um, it's a little higher per kilometer than what we would have paid for the five and a half or six kilometers we did on the first two phases of County Road 3, but given that that was a much longer stretch, you get lower prices usually on the bigger jobs. So, um, it was close to what the estimated cost was. In fact, it was less than what the consulting engineers estimated for this project. Councillor Margeson. Yes, this question through to the staff. Is this funding three-way as for the first section of Rednersville Road, which was a funding arrangement through a grant that was from the federal and provincial government? Or does anyone know? Just does say that? I could answer that, Mr. Chairman. Um, the uh, funding for this project was, there was a surplus left over from the uh, original 
County Road 3 project between County Road 28 and County Road 23. And the surplus funding was uh, uh, requested from the provincial government for authority to use that surplus funding towards an extension of the project. The, uh, the funding arrangement was uh, one third each, one third federal, one third provincial, and one third municipality. Uh, we had more than, uh, there was I think approximately $400,000 available from provincial and federal funds and the balance of it, the county had still surplus from its share of the original uh, 10 points something million dollar allocation for the project. Got a follow up or? Yeah, so that's yes. It's still funded on the one third, one third. And that's every the, cost, the, is it, Joe? The, the funding, the, the, the allocation that was in the original budget is sufficient to cover this project, yes. Except, as I've noted in my report, for the other additional project in there, the drainage at 1352, 1354, there's an additional amount required because the allocation in the 2019 budget wasn't sufficient. Councilor Bullock. Thank you, Mr. Chair question for staff uh, or two actually the first one is what is our track record with the uh, with the low bid contractor have we dealt with them before etc was the question what is our experience with the low bidder yes I've never dealt with that contractor before but um, our consultants check the three references and they seem uh, more than adequate to do the job I would say that the uh, one reference from the city of Belleville, uh, they did a three and a half million dollar job, the Higgs Road extension, which is a significant project. They did another two million dollar project in uh, Haldeman County, and then a, a five hundred thousand dollar project in Quinney West, which included road and water main construction. Okay, good. I just asked that because of our experience with the washroom in Emilesburg Village. Um, And the second question was, I forgot what my second question was, so. Okay, no other questions? Okay, we know the motion, all in favor? Carry. Uh, moves us to 6.3, the report of the Development Services Department dated February 6, 2020 regarding the agreement for engineering services county road three extension can I have a mover and a seconder for that councillor harper and councillor mcnaughton can you read it please harper mcnaughton motion that the report of development services department dated feb 6 2020 regarding the agreement for consulting engineering services county road three reconstruction contract 2019-edw-58 be received the client engineer agreement between the county and dm mills associates limited be approved and that the bylaw listed on the agenda to authorize execution of an agreement between the County of Prince Edward and DM Wills Associates Limited be brought forward to the February 18th, 2020 meeting of council for enactment. Any questions? Questions? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Moves us 6.4. Report of the Development Service Department dated February 6, 2020, regarding drainage issue 549 Miller Road. Can I have a mover and a seconder on that? Councillor McMahon and Councillor Margotson. Can you read it, please? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a McMahon Margotson motion that the report of the Development Services Department dated February 6, 2020, regarding the drainage issue with 549 Miller Road be received and that the county initiate the procedures necessary to utilize the Drainage Act to address the drainage issue at 549 Miller Road. Any questions? Oh, uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, to you, Mr. Chair, uh, the people uh, related to this issue are here and they'd like to speak. Um, I ask that you waive the rules to allow them their chance to, to speak on the issue as they are the property owners. Um, uh, just to add some clarity, Chair, I think it was a, a confusion about our process that the earlier opportunity looked like it was related to the deputations as opposed to uh, every item on the agenda. So that's why we're asking. So they get three minutes to speak then? So can I have a motion for that? Uh, St. Jean and Mayor Ferguson. Okay, uh, if you come up to the podium and... Oh, Oh, all in favor? 
Okay. <laughs> Uh, state your name and address, and uh, you got three minutes. So I'll Thank tell you when you have had two and a half minutes, I'll let you know you got 30 seconds left. Absolutely. Thank you very much. My name is Bill Chrysanthopoulos. I am the homeowner, aside also with my parents, Nick and Alice Chrysanthopoulos of 549 Miller Road, which I believe is Hallowell Township. I'm not really sure, but uh, what I'm going to do right now is just give you the salient points of what what our proposal was and what we sent already. The, I believe that... Um, um, engineer here, Mr. Angelo, was also aware of this issue, and I'm just going to get right into it. So when we applied for the permits um, to build our house there on our property, we asked many questions, but no one mentioned any water issues on our property in the year 2012. In the year 2013, when we started to complain about these, the water issues to the county, the county suggested a swale on our property, an open swale. We kept complaining until the year 2018 when we had the second basement flooding. In February 2018, Mr. Robert McCauley, the ex-CAO, stated that in, e in an email that, he, that there was a budget set aside for our water issues of $125,000. The amount was included in the budget for 2019. In 2019, the engineers suggested an easement on the east side of our property, in, in my property. The water issue is not solved with just one easement. We actually need three major drain systems east, east side of our property, the middle, and the west side of my property. The reason is, is the two culverts under the roadways that drain the water on my property, but there are also other, another two culverts west and east of my property that feed the water into the two culverts located in front of my property. And there are four culverts between Crows Road and Clark Road uh, for a distance of 1.3 kilometers. This is the issue. All of this water from the west, the east, and the south drain onto my private property. Millions of contaminated water, gallons uh, of water, uh, drain onto my property per, uh, per season, uh, onto my um, organic certified farm. And we have pictures attached, which I've also sent. This is an annoying issue for the past seven years, and please allow us to do this ourselves with, with your budget. Uh, I do not want the county to have access to my private farms in regards to easements or swales. Uh, because of this contaminated water, there was 1,500 trees that were planted uh, in 2014 that died, 1,300 of them, because of this contaminated water that the water drains for off of the uh, roadways and other fields onto my property. Um, so the advantage of this proposal is the owners will hire a drain expert, a local contractor from you the got county. Thirty Brendan, seconds left. Brendan Conley, who will perform the work. The homeowners will assume all liability of any water drain issues from the day you approve the expenses of $100,000. This issue will be considered, resolved, and closed, and no more request inquiries of the county staff about the drain and ditch issues uh, or culvert matters for 549 Miller Road. And the homeowners will be in charge of maintaining the ditches in front of the property and any other future drain improvements that we may encounter. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sorry. Is there any questions of the deputant? No? Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, Councillor Margaretson. Thank you, sir, for informing us of your concerns. Are you, were, from what you said, I couldn't quite interpret, are you prepared to cooperate with the municipality in resolving the drainage issues if it in fact involves works on your farm? Yes, it is. But the emphasis is, is that I would like to get, I would like to endeavor that project ourselves with a private contractor. And the reason why is because I do not want the county to have any easement rights on my property for investment purposes. This is, this is the difference between, you see, I don't want the county to have an open swale. This is a working organic farm. And I do not want anything from the county to, to, to have access or, or any future access onto my private property. You have to understand, sir, that this is an investment, a large investment that we've already placed, close to seven figures. And for, for us to have a resale value and to say to, the, uh, you know, to any future purchasers, oh, by the way, the county has easement rights on our property, which it doesn't have right now, I don't think is a good move in our, in our, in our part. This is why I would like to take the endeavor on ourselves from a local contractor, Brendan Conley, whom I know that the county has already hired for other projects here in the county. And he is a drained expert. Okay. So, can, so follow can, up then, uh, sorry. Okay. I, so were, were you prepared to accept the other conditions if you did the work? 
Yes, the conditions being what, sir? Well, you read out that yes, you would liability. There would be no liability. no whatsoever. I, I'll sign a legal document, sir. Once I, I do I'm just receive, trying that. to clarify. So Absolutely, for I have it in writing. Okay. I will not go against uh, back off what I say. Thank so you. So, can I, um, Madam CEO, can I maybe we have an explanation from staff then uh, on that, just to kind of clear the air. Or do you want, is there any more questions first of the deputy? Um, I think we should really hear from staff. I think is you okay? A quick one. So, when you purchased your property, maybe it was a dry year, but clearly this area has long been a. There's been, you know, there's water issues, right? You're in the spot where there probably has historically been water issues. I mean, these aren't. You know, the, where the water is flowing is, is not new. So did, there was no... That was never, uh, sorry. Yeah, so that was never... That was know, never disclosed. Your real estate agent didn't never. let you know that... Not even, not even the county when, so, they ended up, uh, per, when we ended up getting our, our uh, permits. In my opinion, I don't think the permits should have ever even been issued had they disclosed this to us. If, if, if anyone, if either the real estate agent or even the county, and I feel that the county also should have been especially the people who um, issue the, the zone permits, should have disclosed this to us because if it's something that's nothing new to you, it was new to us. So and this is something that should have been addressed prior to us um, build, building our home. Had this, been, had this been told to us, I would have went back to the drawing board and redesigned my house to not even have a basement. Okay, yeah, so, so when you say zone, did you... Did, was this a, did you get a severance first and then a building permit or no. was it already uh, no we just we just purchased the property and we got building permits to build our house and our and our buildings out, out buildings okay, okay so, is there, so any, there was no is, due diligence is there any other questions can i have a motion to receive uh the remarks from uh, councillor margaret said in a seconder uh, uh Prin councillor prinzen so okay, margaret's and prinzen motion to receive the comments related to the item number sorry 6.4 drainage issue 549 Miller Road thank you well, thank you can, so can we have all staff favor. Oh, all in favor <laughs> it's carried can we have staff do a presentation or So we just want to give you some background on um, what's, I guess, where we stand. Kind of let us know. I mean, um, what what he's asking, I guess, is the county. He doesn't want the county to do anything. I guess we just need to know what's. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I can make some comment if you wish, since I did draft this report. But as I, to summarize it briefly, uh, when I was handed this project last summer to see if something could be resolved, I met on site with the owners and uh, discussed what my intent was to do some surveying to see where we could perhaps redirect that water. Uh, when I met them, I asked if it would be possible to go across their property as well, as well as going down um, to Crow's Road and across there. And uh, they indicated they didn't wish me to have our surveys go on the property. So we continued on and did the um, drainage survey all the way down to the uh, creek and uh, drew up plans and, uh, to see if it was possible to drain it. And I think as I summarized here, uh, that uh, drainage route, which is about a mile, it's almost flat. And that's the problem. And uh, confirming what the owner addressed here at the podium, yes, there's uh, three culverts at least fronting their property, and they all sort of drain towards his land, very flat, mind you. And we looked at the possibility of even if we did put a ditch all the way through to the creek down across Crows Road, uh, there'd be a, d a deep ditch there, it'd be about eight feet deep when we got down to the intersection, so, and we wouldn't have enough road allowance to be able to even construct it, as I summarized here in my report. Uh, I then went back again and met with the owners again and asked, uh, explained the situation, they understood that, 
and I asked if they would reconsider letting me at least go across their property to see if we could find a shorter route to the same creek that we were aiming for, and they were not willing to let me have the survey done. With that, then I uh, discussed it with the, with the director and uh, was suggested that perhaps the other alternative then would be to explore solving the problem under the drainage act. Thank you, Joe. So is there any questions? Councillor Maynard? Yeah, so just uh, because we don't, can you explain about the drainage act and what that solution would be. I know there's some here in the report, but just a, uh, can you give us a, um, a little refresher on the, the powers of the drainage act? Okay, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I'll try to summarize the, the, the steps that would be involved with it. So under the, under the drainage act, if to, to get this started, we would get, you know, the, the okay from you, uh, um, I guess at, at the following council meeting, the first step there would be for one of the landowners to petition council. Um, municipality is one of the landowners as the road authority. So in this case, it would be the acting director of operations that would petition council for municipal drain in this property. Um, that would go to council. And if council approves that step, then the next step would be to hire a drainage engineer who's trained under the drainage act. That drainage engineer then undertakes a study and looks at the catchment area and uh, undertakes a study, looks at total catchment area and identifies the, uh, the, what lands would benefit from the drainage and what lands uh, would it outlet on. Uh, they, come up with a, they come up with a solution they come up with a cost sharing scenario because it gets a portion to all the benefiting landowners. Uh, and then once that's done, it goes back to council, it gets approved and it becomes final. So the municipal drain then becomes registered. It's there into perpetuity. It becomes protected. Uh, any maintenance costs also get shared with the, uh, with the um, apportioned landowners. Um, and that, you know, in, in that regard, then, then there's no there's no need to register easements. It's under their drainage act. There's no need for any concern about possible ownership changes in the land because it, it it becomes a becomes a bylaw in a sense. But it actually becomes a bylaw. So, okay. so that's in essence uh, that, that's the quick version of how that would work. So, so uh, in essence, just, uh, do we need a motion to extend? I think Councillor Bailey is going to move that. I have a seconder for that. Yep, uh, Mayor Ferguson, all in favor? Okay, sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so the Drainage Act, Act allows us then in situations like this where you can't come to resolution to, to take that water where the water needs to go, right? And to? In, in a, through you, Mr. Chair, in essence, yes. Into, per, into perpetuity as well. It doesn't just last for one one owner. It, it's once it's established, it's established until it's another bylaw. It would take another bylaw to rescind all that. Okay, Councillor Harper. Actually, my question was uh, Councillor Maynard, so I'm fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor McNaughton. Uh, I'm just no. We have a at least one. Um, municipal staff member who has the requisite credentials to become a superintendent, I believe. Uh, yeah, maybe I can anticipate where you're going and answer that question. I doubt it. Yeah, maybe. Well, I'm just saying we've got that potentially that piece in place. What would be the remain? What would be the timeline? Is the is so where I was going through the chair to Council McNaughton. So uh, it is our intention to come back to Council. It was a follow up from the budget to address the fact that our drainage supervisor, superintendent, is identified as Robert McCauley. Uh, so we are planning on bringing a bylaw that would rescind that bylaw and replace that bylaw with someone who is also on staff who has the accreditation. Yes. And then we are also um, putting other staff forward through the training over the next year. So we have a little more redundancy in the um, 
um, drain it will have multiple drainage superintendents in that but yeah. the bulk of the that that is really about who is the liaison between the municipality and the um, interested parties or uh, as as was outlined um, uh, just earlier in this case we are one of them but uh, the work is done by a third party um, engineering so you did actually anticipate my questions for you for tomorrow too so thank you you're a bit of a mind reader mayor ferguson thank you thank you mr chair um i, I guess i'll ask the uh, the staff this have you seen the proposal from the chrysanthopolis the one we just got about about assuming the responsibility for this i did receive a, a letter from the owner i don't know if it's the same one that you have but it basically spelled out the same things that he addressed at the podium yes okay is any of what he's proposing on municipal property i believe that what he's proposing is that they would take the drainage from where ponds now in front of his property and direct it to the creek, which is, I, I call it, to the north of his property. So it's, it, it's not our property? No, it's not our property. He okay. would be directing it through his property. I just want property. that clarified. Yeah. Okay, so, all right. And to your knowledge, has anything like this ever happened before? I'm not familiar with it. I would respectfully suggest that if, if you were going to consider something like this, you might want to get a legal opinion well, first. Kind of where I'm going. This sets something of a precedence on the basis of the proposal. So, thanks. I'll wait to hear what everybody else has to say. Councilor Margaretson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is just a follow-up on, on your response to Councillor Maynard. You, you said that the municipality, as the road authority, would petition for, for a drainage study. Do the other landowners, or do the majority of the landowners, have to be involved in that petition? And I'm, this is specifically regarding the, the landowner that is having the difficulty. Do they have to be involved in that petition? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, my understanding is no. Um, if it's just landowners on their own, then I think it's about 60% of the landowners need to come forward with the petition. But the road authority on its own can be its can petition on its own without any other landowners. That's my understanding. And just to follow up, then, if we're heading trying to get towards the creek, have you discussed anything with the adjacent landowners to 549? to see if they were more amiable towards. Do you mean, have, have we discussed it to date well, with any of the other landowners? I just, no, no we're there's trying not to, to get my over knowledge, to the no. creek. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, Joe. Like, if I, I'm not aware that anyone has discussed yeah. it with any other okay. landowners. Thank you. Councilor Bullock. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a question for staff, the three culverts there. I, I take it there's been no change to the drainage situation. There's been no construction or lack of maintenance over the last few years. Is that accurate? Through you, Mr. Chair, I, I'm not aware of what sort of maintenance or operations people have done along that roadway where the three culverts you're referring to are. I, I don't have that information. But you've walked the ground. I'm sorry? You've walked the ground. I've walked it and I've driven it, yes. Okay. And there's, it's the, uh, I can tell you that it's, it's, it's overgrown a lot, as probably a lot of those rural roads are. Okay. But there's been no construction or anything. The, it, the drainage is as it has been for years. It doesn't appear that there's been any construction or reconstruction of the ditches that I can see. Okay, no other questions? Uh, no, uh, you had, we gave you the three minutes. Okay, so we know the motion is on the floor. Uh, all in favor? Can we hear who the first, uh, second or who moved it and seconder was, please? Phil. Mm -hmm. Councilor McMahon and Councilor Mark. 
Okay, can you read it again, please? Okay, uh, McMahon Margaretson motion that the report of Development Services Department dated February 6, 2020, regarding the drainage issue at 549 Miller Road be received, that the county initiate procedures necessary to utilize the Drainage Act to address the drainage issue at 549 Miller Road. Okay, all in favor? Okay. I would just suggest that before we initiate those procedures, based on the answer we got, that perhaps some further discussions with neighboring landowners may be a step we should take so before do you want to, going you, to the arbitration type. Do you got an amending motion or another motion then, amending motion? I, I think that could be a direction to staff that, that we can initiate that um, with, after further discussions. And if they're not fruitful, uh, I, don't, I don't know if we need a motion yeah. to amend. So, to point, um, through the chair, point of clarity. So, I think that um, be, uh, because uh, as the steps were outlined, we, our very first step, we come back to council. So, we can take it as staff direction to have the conversations with neighbors and um, be able to answer that question better next time uh, when we bring the first step of this process if you uh, pass this motion. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, I think. Uh, okay. Council Margerson has got a, got a amending motion, but do you want to speak to the motion that's here? Question, yes. Okay. Councillor Hirsch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a question on the on the cost. The the um, residents of 549 Miller have suggested that with $125,000, they could undertake this drainage. Does staff have any idea if we follow the drainage act process that was that Peter you described? What is the likely estimate of cost and what portion of that would be ours versus what portion would the um, would the resident have to absorb thank you uh, through you mr chair really hard to say at this stage that's part of the part of the exercise that the drainage engineer would undertake so the first step would well one of the steps would be to identify what the catchment area is and all the different landowners that would benefit from this municipal drain have a prorated share uh, and, and we're one of the landowners as a municipality. Um, so as far as what our share would be, be, we don't know that until that, that analysis is done. We're thinking that what the budget that we have here would more than cover our share. But, you know, at, at this stage, I don't know how big the catchment area is. I don't know what the proportion sizes are. Uh, but for sure, the, you know, that all the landowners that are part of this have, would would be contributing. Councillor Roberts. Just a tiny question to staff. I think Mayor Ferguson raised the issue of precedent if we were to accept the Chrysanthopoulos family proposal. Is, what has what is staff's thought about that precedent and are there any other issues? Because I think their proposal is actually $100,000. So I'd be interested in knowing that. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the, if, if, I'm assuming it's the same propo proposal that we received in the fall, or, um, and that was discussed with the acting CAO at the time, who was also the drainage superintendent, um, and it, there, was, there was not a, we were, we were directed not to proceed that way. Um, one of the reasons was is it, it's, it's okay for the current owner to be accepting of this, but properties change hands so what happens to this in the future uh, it's still once the water crosses our property being the road and goes on to other property a, a future owner may not be as accepting uh, of that water we may be right back here again with a new owner so there's nothing that guarantees that into perpetuity that being one of the biggest reasons that we were directed not to proceed with that Okay, so Councillor Margerson has 
an amending motion. Well, after, thank you, Mr. Chair. After hearing uh, Madam CAO's response to the other issues, my thought was to recap on the, the landowner's proposal with a preliminary legal opinion. If there is any mechanism, and I understand their issue of clouding title with an easement, um, but the other way, if, if our, our engineers saying that in future land transactions, the new landowner may not want to honor your commitment of holding the municipality harmless, it may have to be registered on title and you may not like that, but we need to be protected. So I would like to include just another look at that to see if there legally is any mechanism that makes the municipality not responsible in the future and also gives them the opportunity to do the drainage works that they see is uh, required so to the chair so then are you suggesting uh, an amendment to uh, the second part of the motion to say that we would uh, something along the lines uh, our clerk is better at this on the fly than i am um staff would seek a legal opinion uh to explore um in, insert something um, uh, <laughs> and failing that the yeah. that the well, county I think yes. you understand what I'm saying yeah. here okay. I, I see number two is messy yeah. so. do we have a seconder for yeah. mayor Ferguson so I'll just you will just have a second uh, till we hear what the motion reads here Chair, in collaboration with staff, moved by Councillor Margotson, seconded by Mayor Ferguson, that a legal opinion be sought regarding the proposal presented by the property owners at 549 Miller Road, and failing that, and failing a satisfactory solution, the county initiate the procedures necessary to utilize the Draining Act to address the drainage issue at 549 Miller Road. Councilor Marcuson, you good with that? Okay. So, I you got a question to the amendment? Okay. I'm not sure whether we're going to be spending our money wisely on that because I, without giving an opinion myself, I, I, I know what the answer is going to be. <clears throat> it's going to be spelled easement. And I said preliminary or legal, not get into the weeds. Okay. 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 So, yeah. <laughs> so we we had the motion, the amending motion. Is there any other questions on that motion? Could it be read again? Sorry. Could it be read again? Through you, Mr. Chair. That the report of the Development Services Department dated February 6, 2020, regarding the drainage issue at 549 Miller Road be received, and that a legal opinion be sought regarding the proposal presented by the property owners at 549 Miller Road. And failing a satisfactory solution, the county initiate the procedures necessary to utilize the Drainage Act to address the drainage issue at 549 Miller Road. Okay, so all in favor? Opposed, it's carried. Yeah. 
So that moves us to 6.5. Civic recognition for Larry Snyder, Catherine Snyder, Gail Eisthead, and Edward Rand for coordinating and preparing a free Christmas dinner for the community for 20 years. Can I have a Councillor St. Jean and Councillor Harper? Can you read that, please? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. J uh, who was my seconder again? Me. Councillor Harper. Councillor Harper, wonderful. Uh, St. Jean Harper motion. Uh, whereas on December 25th, 2019, Larry Snyder, Catherine Snyder, Gail Eisted and Edward Rand prepared and served a free Christmas dinner for the community for the 20th year in a row that a civic recognition nomination for Larry Snyder, Catherine Snyder, Gail Eisted and Edward Rand be received and approved and that a civic recognition award be presented to Larry Snyder, Catherine Snyder, Gail Eisted and Edward Rand at the February 18th, 2020 meeting of council. If I may speak to it, sir. Yep, go ahead. Just very briefly. Uh, please check the spelling of the Snyder's names. I believe it's a Y. Would want that incorrect on a recognition certificate. And, and uh, also, uh, I'd just like to say, I had an interesting conversation with Mr. Snyder yesterday. I didn't let the cat out of the bag, though. Uh, and, and to The community knows that they have decided not to continue this year, but it has the, the torch, so to speak, or the carving utensils for the turkey shall be passed on to another organization within the community and they will be continuing this. It's an amazing uh, uh, thing that they started, started small and it grew to over 400 Christmas dinners uh, uh, each and every year for the last 20 years. I went there on Christmas Day to, to uh, wander through and, uh, and congratulate them and it, it's amazing to see the, what our community does for all of its people in our, and uh, I was extremely touched and I'm very happy to be able to uh, make that motion and support it, so thank you. Mayor Ferguson? I just want to um, uh, concur with uh, mm -hmm. Councillor St. Jean. It, it is really quite remarkable to walk into that dinner and see um, people who, um, you know, are there out of, it's a mixed bag, people out of there who um, have no place else to go, um, elderly people who live alone, um, who congregate with with others and come out and make a party of it is really quite remarkable, but, and everybody loves it. And uh, last year when I went, uh, I was, I was um, you know, asked if I wanted to say anything, and I, I said no. And uh, um, as they spoke into the microphone, said, "Well, Mayor Forrester doesn't want to say anything." <laughs> <laughs> but it, it really is a, a remarkable event. So I, I'm fully supportive of this, and and uh, hope the torch is passed passed along and it carries on for years to come because it's a crucial um, crucial event for so many people. Anybody else? Nope. All in favor? Carried. Uh, motion to adjourn. Yep. <laughs> Councillor Margetson and Councillor Prinzen. This is Margetson Prinzen motion that this meeting now adjourn at 4.25 p.m. Thank you. All in favor? All in favor. Gary. Mike.